that's great that I can do it. <laughs> but that was important to do. No, that's perfect. That's, I shouldn't use all my time. So uh, thank you for our witnesses for being here today. This hearing cannot be timelier as our committee and the Congress as a whole looks at issues regarding artificial intelligence. It's important that we shine a light specifically on the role that AI could play in solving some of our most significant health care problems. These emerging technologies are already changing the way in which clinicians care for their patients and how researchers conduct uh, clinical trials. <coughs> Excuse me. As AI continues to drive innovation in healthcare, it is essential that Congress examine the meaningful benefits that any potential unintended consequences that these technologies could have. The potential benefits from artificial intelligence are seemingly without limit. Future technologies could help our healthcare system save lives by better predicting potential diagnoses and could help us reduce redundancies in our system. We have already seen this play out in real time over the past several years and have watched unimaginable advances in healthcare as a result of generative AI. For example, there are already numerous success stories in using AI for pharmaceutical research and development to get treatments to the market sooner. This was the case in the AI-assisted research by MIT scientists that found the drug Halicin could be used as an effective antibiotic. We now have multi-cancer screening diagnostic tools that use AI to de help detect early stage cancers. And AI is being used in operating rooms to augment existing processes to improve patient outcomes. However, this is not to say that we should let the use of these technologies go without guardrails. Over the next several months, years and years, policymakers and those in the health industry will need to answer some fundamental questions, <coughs> excuse me, regarding the role AI will play in our healthcare system, including are the technologies trained with supervised AI using human-generated inputs to drive outcomes? Are these technologies trained uh, with unsupervised AI that's generating outcomes based off human behavior to ease everyday decision making for healthcare consumers? Or are these technologies trained with reinforced AI, which humans are rewarding this, the systems for the outputs generated? Those are very complex and difficult things that we have to explore as we move forward. And in each of the, these use cases, it's important to remember that every decision comes with a cost, both human and financial. Wearable devices that are constantly monitoring someone's heart rate, caloric intake, and, and outtake, and sleep patterns in addition to other metrics can help lead to healthier lifestyles, and in some cases to predicting extreme cardiac event or even strokes. In the event of using user data to predict better lifestyle habits, how are we ensuring this data is secure and ensuring that consumers have full control over this information and it's not being used or sold without their consent? In the event of predicting a major health event, are there protocols that should be considered to ensure individuals aren't taking unnecessary trips to the emergency room and potentially incurring significant health care debt as a result. In closing, I support the real possibilities AI can bring to our health care system and, in most, and most importantly to patients. We should give the technology the license to coexist alongside clinicians, patients, and innovators as well as regulators while also remaining, remaining vigilant of how this technology is being used. I look forward to the discussion today. And I will yield back. And uh, to continue my <coughs> praise for the ranking member, I will recognize the gentlewoman from California. And as I said, we have a year to work together. And, and when you were chair and I was ranking member, you treated me with most respect and really appreciate. In the areas where we don't didn't agree, you challenged my thinking sometimes. And sometimes we had to move forward in different directions. Sometimes we couldn't. But it was always with the utmost uh, respect. So with that, I will uh, recognize the ranking member for five minutes for her opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Uh, your words mean a great deal to me, and I'm, I'm deeply moved and touched by the expression of uh, all of the members of this subcommittee. Uh, you know how much I love this committee, and uh, we've gotten so many important things done, gotten them over the finish line. Uh, let's optimize our time and... Uh, uh, so that we can uh, continue that tradition. So thank you to each one of you. Um, uh, you're, you're all my friends, my fellow Americans, my fellow colleagues. And, uh, uh, well, there's so much that I want to say. There are, there, really, there aren't words to express how deeply, deeply grateful I am. And uh, the messages that 
poured in. I, I just, uh, I've kept them all and I reread them before I go to sleep at night. <laughs> and uh, uh, they're really beautiful. It's like uh, uh, falling asleep on this magnificent cloud of uh, goodwill. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. So uh, here we are to discuss AI and healthcare. Uh, and uh, the nexus between the two is really a very, very, very important one. Uh, it's, it represents an incredible opportunity uh, for our country, and it has the potential to make our healthcare system more efficient, uh, improve patient experiences, and reduce burdens on uh, <coughs> physicians. Uh, and new ways to use AI um, in the healthcare setting are consistently in the news. I think all of you see this in your national clips as you uh, read them at the end of, uh, of every day. Uh, New York Times in uh, October of this year, new AI tool diagnoses brain tumors on the operating table. Forbes in August of this year, AI is a game changer for toughest areas of drug discovery. The Wall Street Journal in November of last year, US-backed researchers use uh, AI to probe for weaknesses in drug supply chains. And uh, despite this incredible uh, promise, AI, we know, and uh, some of the fathers and mothers of AI have instructed us uh, on the potential uh, that AI has uh, to, uh, it's at the other part of the spectrum, uh, to worsen uh, patient outcomes and exacerbate uh, inequities uh, that we have in our health care system if it's not deployed uh, with adequate uh, uh, guardrails. Uh, earlier this month, reports found in a lawsuit, it now alleges, that United Health Group, uh, one of the largest uh, insurers in our country, used an AI algorithm to wrongfully deny care to Medicare Advantage uh, beneficiaries. Uh, the AI algorithm made decisions about patient care that went against the recommendations of the patient's own physicians. Another example is our nation's children are being left behind uh, as AI in medical imaging rapidly uh, expands. Uh, and to date, there are no computer-aided uh, detection, computer-assisted triage, or computer-aided diagnosis radiology products authorized for pediatric uses. And these uh, pediatric radiologists are working with children. You can't experiment on children. So uh, uh, the, um, you know, in many, in many areas, the red lights are blinking, and we need to pay attention to that, because children are not little uh, adults. I'm working on a proposal to address this gap for pediatric patients. Uh, and in uh, my view and the view of both Republican and Democratic members uh, of both the House and the Senate have created uh, legislation that would democratize uh, uh, AI. Uh, uh, today, uh, the resources, the massive resources, are really in the hands of a handful of very large high technology companies. Uh, but we have... Uh, many <coughs> sectors in our country, and the, uh, the health sector, the medical sector, needs to be a, a partner in this as well. Uh, so this uh, legislation, I'm so proud uh, that there are members of this committee, including uh, Mr. Uh, Obernolte, uh, that are original co-sponsors of that legislation, and I would urge those of you that are not on it uh, to take a look at it so uh, that we can get that over the finish line in this Congress. So uh, I'm pleased that uh, the witnesses are here. I'm happy to be with each one of you, of my colleagues. Uh, I think that this committee can lead the effort uh, on AI uh, as it applies to health care. In fact, we must. I, I don't think this is, uh, you know, uh, it's not on the one hand, but on the other hand. Uh, we have to rise uh, to this challenge, and I think that uh, we have the capacity to do so. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back, and uh, the chair will now recognize the chair of the full committee, Chair Rogers, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, 
my heartfelt warm wishes to the ranking Democrat Anna Eshoo. You know, she's been a trailblazer for so many members, including me, and I'm grateful for your uh, outstanding leadership and your friendship these years. This is now the fourth hearing that the Energy and Commerce Committee has held across our subcommittees on the subject of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has the potential to transform every aspect of our lives, for better or for worse. It's critical that America, not China, is the one addressing AI's challenges and leading in this technology's development and deployment. The best way to start is by laying the groundwork to protect people's information with a national data privacy standard. This is a foundational first step towards a safe and prosperous AI future in healthcare and beyond. I look forward to continuing to discuss how we can improve privacy protections for Americans as we incorporate AI tools into our lives. And I'm proud of each of our subcommittee chairs for leading on this important issue. AI has a unique role to play in the future of healthcare. AI could help find the next breakthrough cure or improve our ability to catch deadly diseases earlier. And we're already seeing that artificial intelligence can be used to aid in the assessment of medical imaging, which is one of which uh, one of our witnesses will discuss in detail. Additionally, AI is reducing administrative burdens on healthcare providers. We've all heard from providers in our districts about the burden of necessary but cumbersome paperwork, how often this leads to burnout for doctors and nurses, and how it eats up time that they could be spending providing actual patient care. For just about my entire tenure in Congress, one of the top issues that we have struggled with has been finding ways to cut paperwork and redundancy in our healthcare system so that we can let doctors do what doctors do best, treat their patients. For years, we've nibbled around the edges of this issue, but the future of AI could be transformative and will hopefully let doctors be doctors instead of administrative staff. We'll hear more from Dr. Schussler from HCA on how this is being tested out in hospitals. To be clear, AI will not solve all the problems with America's healthcare system. One concern we've been, we have frequently heard is the potential of human biases to be implicitly baked into AI technologies. The first piece of healthcare legislation that this committee advanced this year was my bill to ban the usage of quality adjusted life years or qualies, which are discriminatory measures that are used by federal payers to deny healthcare services to people with disabilities and chronic illnesses. If AI is reliant on qualies or other similar measures when assisting in clinical decision making, our most vulnerable will be left behind. No one here wants to advocate for discrimination and we need to be conscious of how federal programs and AI technologies incorporate these types of biases and what we should be thinking about in this area. I'll close by saying that I am optimistic about these technologies. I think these technologies can make a difference in the lives of patients and this committee needs to lead the way in supporting innovation. For America to lead, we must strike the right balance with AI, one that gives businesses the flexibility to remain agile as they develop these cutting edge technologies while also ensuring responsible use. A national standard for the collection and handling of data will provide businesses, healthcare providers, and every American with clear and understandable protections wherever they are. Today's hearing will hopefully shed more light on the current landscape of AI and healthcare and hopefully provide us with further insight on the next steps that we should take to support patients. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, the chair will now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Ranking Member Pallone, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to start out by thanking our two Democratic members of the subcommittee who have announced their retirements at the end of next year. Of course, I told them both they should change their minds, and they said they don't want to. But, let me start with Ranking Member Eshoo, who served as the top Democrat on the subcommittee for the last five years, including four years as chair, and she led the subcommittee through the COVID-19 pandemic. She played a clear, critical role in our successful efforts to reauthorize user fees and to create ARPA-H, but that's just in the last session. She's been so much involved in all healthcare issues on this committee for a long time. But I also think a lot of you don't know uh, that I've worked with Anna even before the Energy and Commerce Committee, and she's played a critical role 
outside of the committee in many ways, particularly with Armenian causes. Uh, if it was not for Anna, the House would never have recognized the Armenian genocide, which was such an important thing in the history of Armenians um, that, that that happened and that we did that. Um, so thank you, Anna. And then Tony, uh, I have to say, Tony Karnas has been a longtime leader on the subcommittee. He's also served as the vice chair of our Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee for four years. He's led several of our key efforts to put consumers first, including a new law that protects babies from dangerous sleeping products. But again, um, you know, I want to emphasize Tony's role outside of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, with the Hispanic Caucus, with Bold Pack. He's just played uh, a, a tremendous role in promoting not only Latino members, uh, but also the issues that are important to the to the Latino community. So in both cases, uh, in Anna's case, as well as Tony's case, what they accomplished here is important for our committee, but really goes beyond the committee. So thank you both. Um, but I have to say, we still have another year left, so I want to thank them for their contributions, but there's still more to be done, as they've already said. So let me let me go, if I can, to the to the issue that we're dealing with today. And we are exploring how artificial intelligence is changing healthcare now and potentially in the future. Uh, this is an important hearing because the integration of AI presents opportunities to enhance patient care and streamline processes to bring more efficiency to the health sector. At the same time, Congress must recognize and address the complex ethical, legal, economic, and social concerns raised by the specter of greater deployment of AI in our healthcare system. As we're going to hear today, access to patient medical data is often central to the use of AI in the delivery of health care. As the patient's medical data passes between physicians through these AI products, protecting individuals' information and privacy becomes even more important. So I remain concerned that the expanded use of AI in healthcare has generated significant risks. It's critical that safeguards are in place to protect the privacy and security of the patient's data. And I've said at each of our AI hearings this year, I strongly believe that as a bedrock of any AI regulation, we must enact strong federal data privacy protections for all consumers. AI cannot function without large quantities of data, and we must ensure that this increased data demand does not come at the expense of consumers' right to privacy. And I'm going to continue to push for a comprehensive national federal privacy standard. I know the chair is just as concerned. I believe it's the only way we can limit the unscrupulous data collection and selling practices of big tech and third-party entities. It's also the only way we can ensure all of our personal medical information is protected online and protected against algorithmic bias or security breaches. AI's role in the adjudication of medical claims specifically poses a great concern to me. Despite potential to revolutionize the healthcare landscape, AI in certain instances could result in the denial of medical care, potentially worsening health inequities. Right now, there's a class action lawsuit against one major insurer's use of AI to deny medical claims. AI systems allegedly played a role in the denial of over 300,000 payment requests within a two-month period. The average time spent supposedly reviewing each of these claims was a mere 1.2 seconds. Now, AI tools can aid and support healthcare providers, but their recommendations should not serve as a substitute for the nuanced judgment of our healthcare professionals. AI has potential to supplement medical decisions. However, when, a when healthcare companies driven by efficiency implement AI suggestions without subjecting them to critical scrutiny, I worry that patient safety could be put at risk. So there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, and I want to thank the chairman of the subcommittee and the chair of the full committee for prioritizing this. Thanks again. I yield back. If the gentleman would yield me a couple of seconds. I, I didn't see that Tony Cardenas had come into the room when I yeah. talked about it, and I want to oh. say the same thing. And there's been a spe several issues, but specifically one I remember that we had to plow through a lot of issues to get through to help small businesses that were affected, and we were focused on working together and coming to common ground, and that was a, a great experience. And so congratulations to you. and. We got another year to, to work together moving forward. So the gentleman yields back and I, and I will yield back. And so thanks and we'll have more time to, to congratulate as we move forward this year. To party is what you said, okay. That sounds, we'll see what happens, right? So uh, now we'll, that concludes member statements and we will move to our witnesses opening statement and I'll introduce each one of you then call on you, uh, it, uh, introduce you in, as a group and then call on you 
to, to give your opening statement. And those of you who have not testified, I think some of you have, some of you may not have, is that you'll have a green light. I think it goes for four minutes. Five, were the green lights for five minutes? Okay. They have five minutes to testify. You four minutes, you'll have a green light. Then you get a yellow light. And once you have the LI, that shows you got a minute left. And when the red light uh, hits, it's time to wrap up and we'll uh, move forward. So today I will uh, first uh, rec introduce Dr. Michael Slosher, uh, Senior Vice President of Care, Transformation and Innovation at HCA Healthcare. Dr. Benjamin Wynn, and you said that was a, a proper pronunciation of your name, uh, Senior Product Manager, Transcarent. Uh, Mr. Peter Shin. A head of Digital Health, North America, Siemens Health and Health and Ears. Uh, Dr. Christopher Longhurst, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Digital Officer, and Association Dean, Association Dean, uh, U.S. San Diego Health. And then also Dr. David Newman Toker, uh, Director, Division of Neurovisual and Vestibular Disorders, Department of Neurology, Professor of Neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I uh, appreciate you all for being here and taking the time to be here today. This hearing is important, and I will begin by recognizing Dr. Slosher. You're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure your microphone is either on and then push, and then, uh, yeah, it's up to your, yeah, if you'll lift it up, it should bend towards you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Subcommittee Chairman Guthrie and Ranking Member Eshoo, as well as Chairman uh, McMorris Rogers and uh, Ranking Member Pallone and the STEAM members of this committee for inviting me to testify here today. I am Dr. Michael Saucer, Senior Vice President for Care Transformation and Innovation at HCA Healthcare. I have a background in neurosurgery, in hospital operations, and deep involvement in healthcare and AI technology, and so excited to share my perspectives uh, and how HCA is approaching AI in healthcare. At HCA Healthcare, our commitment to integrating AI into healthcare is driven by a vision to enhance patient care and operational efficiency and effectiveness. Our initial use cases are focused largely on removing administrative burden from clinicians, providers, and leaders so we can return precious time to them, allowing them to focus on patients, critical decision making, and other high risk activities like transitions of care. Allowing these colleagues to function at the top of their license will create expanded healthcare workforce with the time and tools to deliver a superior standard of care. To achieve these goals, our first step was to develop a responsible AI program involving a robust governance structure to ensure our AI applications are fair, robust, accountable, and continuously evaluated for safety and effectiveness. The stated goal of the program is to both govern and enable the use of AI across our organization. Ensuring the technology is used responsibly but also ensuring we take full advantage of these innovations and the benefits they can provide to our care teams and our patients. When it comes to privacy and security, we have several decades of experience in protecting patient data that has positioned us well to meet the challenges of deploying AI in a secure and private manner. Building on our experience managing patient data under the HIPAA standard, we ensure that all our AI applications adhere to these stringent standards. Patient data and the output of any AI model that in could include protected health information about our patients, as well as the models themselves, are all protected in the same way. Private and secure is also a key feature of our responsible AI program. Finally, we are deploying a new data architecture to support AI, our AI agenda, which focuses on de-identified data sets the primary, as the primary source of training data. This allows for the use of large data sets to develop models and advanced analytics without having to expose individual patient PHI. Another safeguard that we have implemented is a human-centric approach to AI. In all our AI applications, we emphasize a human-in-the-loop approach. This ensures that when we leverage AI for efficiency and accuracy, we do not compromise on safety and responsibility. The human-in-the-loop models also allow for ongoing model development through direct feedback provided inside the workflow for those using the models. The more the models are used, therefore, the better they become. Finally, when it comes to AI-driven decision support tools, these are the models where they are directly advising on the treatment or diagnosis of patients. We believe this is an exciting opportunity for AI in the future, uh, but an area that requires significant testing and research before they can be deployed safely. So with my final time, let me add just three examples of how we're using AI in uh, healthcare across HCA. 
The first is enhancing clinical documentation. We have a system in a partnership with Augmetics where AI can listen to a provider interview a patient in the emergency room. This is live in four ERs. And then transcribe the event and then using natural language processing and large language models, turn that into structured clinical documentation. Moving documentation into an AI assistant mode rather than the doctor as a data entry analyst. The second is streamlining nurse handoff. Nurse handoff occurs almost 400,000 times every week across our 183 hospitals. It's a risky time during a transition of care. We've taught a large language model to read our EHR data and therefore be able to interpret that data and create a handoff tool that the nurses, after they review it themselves, can use to drive that conversation. This will bring standardization and safety to a highly variable and risky time during uh, care delivery. Finally, we're using AI for staffing and scheduling. We've taught uh, an AI algorithm to understand the data surrounding how our care teams are deployed in our hospitals. Care teams are our most valuable resource and ensuring we have the right team in the right place at the right time with the assistance of an AI algorithm is proving to be able to create more balanced, fair, and equitable schedules for our care team members. So in conclusion, at HA Healthcare, we are dedicated to exploring and leveraging AI to enhance patient care and experiences, improve operational efficiency, and uphold the highest standards of privacy and security. We are committed to ongoing dialogue with Congress and with the subcommittee to help ensure the pathway forward provides all the opportunities that our patients deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you the, for your opening statement. The chair now recognizes Dr. Wynn. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Doug. Point it up towards you. How's that? Better? Oh, that's why. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, thank you. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Eshoo, uh, Chairwoman McMorris Rogers, and Ranking Member Pallone, distinguished members of the committee, uh, it's my pleasure to appear before you today to discuss how artificial intelligence is changing healthcare. And my name is Dr. Benjamin Nguyen. I'm a senior product manager at Transcarent, leading our AI team, which is tasked with expanding the Transcarent affiliated clinic suite of AI tools while maintaining the highest standards for patient safety. I've worked at the intersection of technology and care delivery throughout my career with a special focus on artificial intelligence. Transparent was founded to make it easy for people to access high quality affordable healthcare and to offer greater choice and control for healthcare consumers, our members, and employer sponsored health group health plans, our clients. Transparent is not a standalone health plan. Rather, our services make the healthcare journey for our 4.4 million members a more informed and easy one. We help make their existing health medical plan easier to understand and use. Our platform is personalized for each member, guiding them to appropriate care. Uh, we offer access to physicians, on-demand care teams, and a connected ecosystem of in-person and virtual care point solutions. Our affiliated virtual clinic provides chat and video-based telemedicine visits for a wide spectrum of urgent and primary care needs. And in the face of significant demand for virtual care, we use AI tools to improve the experience for our members while reducing the administrative burden on clinicians. When a patient comes to the virtual clinic, an AI assistant immediately begins to gather information from them about the reason for their visit, so that by the time the clinician greets the patient, they have a detailed and relevant summary of the patient's symptoms and history. They can spend their time discussing the diagnosis, treatment decisions, and follow-up care with the patient. AI is already helping these clinicians reduce the administrative burden and frees them up to spend more time on the patients who need it the most without replacing their clinical judgment. But I want to paint a picture for how next-gen AI used thoughtfully can transform the way patients experience healthcare. Imagine a single mother for whom English is a second language with limited health literacy. For us, maybe the 10 to 15 minute doctor visit is enough, but she may need 30 to 60 minutes to ask all the questions she rightfully has about her son's care, and there's nothing wrong with that. But current constraints make this kind of engagement very challenging in a modern medical practice. There are patients in the waiting room, and there aren't enough practitioners. But thoughtfully built AI systems using next-gen technology can help. Imagine an AI chatbot built in partnership with clinicians that can simplify information to her level of comfort or even fluently translate into any language she prefers. In this very near future, she can spend as much time as she wants and needs to. Well-designed systems like this can help us move from a one-size-fits-all approach to a many-sizes-for-many-needs approach. A few years ago, it would have been immensely difficult and expensive to build an AI chatbot so perfectly tailored to this mother's needs but recent leaps in AI technology have made it easier to do this. 
This kind of technology, generative AI, is of a different nature than AI systems you may be familiar with. It can be applied in many domains, but its most common application is in large language models powering chatbots. Chatbots powered by this new AI technology are not human, but they act human-like. They can converse with users, grasp complex, nuanced topics, engage in reasoning, and write in a way that sound in, sounds indistinguishable from a human. To use an analogy, the technological leaps in AI that happened in the five years past to enable this are so great that they're akin to going from locomotives to powered flight. And like the move to powered flight, <coughs> this leap brings with it many opportunities and dangers because generative AI is not perfect and it's prone to certain shortcomings. Even amongst AI companies and experts, there isn't consistent agreement on the best practices for measuring capabilities and safety risks of these new generative technologies, much less how to mitigate them. Healthcare's unique challenges and opportunities mean that we also need to develop our own internal expertise in generative AI. This won't come from the outside, it has to come from within. This brings me to my last point, which is there is a significant and growing gap in AI talent in the healthcare industry. We need more doctors and nurses at the bedside who are as comfortable speaking the language of AI as they are the language of medical care. And the same goes for our healthcare leaders. Having gone to medical school, I know that this doesn't come naturally to our institutions, which are rightfully focused on teaching the science and our art of bedside medicine. But ensuring that AI products serve all Americans equitably demands active participation from all levels of the healthcare system. We need the incentives, frameworks, and collective effort to create these opportunities if we want to ensure that AI achieves its potential in changing the healthcare system for the better. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hey, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And Mr. Shin, you're now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Guthrie, Vice Chair Bouchon, Ranking Member Eshu, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of Siemens Health and Years and our nearly 17,000 employees in the United States and approximately 71,000 employees globally, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the topic of artificial intelligence in healthcare. My name is Peter Shen. I'm the North America Head of Digital Health for Siemens Medical Solutions USA Incorporated, also known as Siemens Health and Years. My career focus is on the introduction of new and emerging technologies in, in the healthcare market, including artificial intelligence. Siemens Health and Ears is a leading medical technology company with more than 120 years of history and experience bringing breakthrough innovations to market that enable healthcare professionals to deliver the best care for patients. Our core portfolio includes imaging, diagnostics, and therapies augmented by digital technologies and artificial intelligence. We partner with more than 90% of the leading providers in healthcare to address issues around population growth and chronic disease management, healthcare workforce shortages, and the lack of access to care in, in underserved areas. We have the distinction of being the only medical technology company capable of end-to-end -end cancer care, from diagnosis and screening to treatment and survivorship. This is a responsibility we take very seriously as we keep patients at the center of everything that we do. Siemens Health and Ears has been working on applying artificial intelligence and medical technology for more than 20 years. At our AI office of Big Data in Princeton, New Jersey, we've built one of the most powerful supercomputing infrastructures dedicated to developing AI in healthcare. This allows our research scientists to collect, prepare, and organize correct and secure medical data needed to train and deliver accurate AI algorithms. From its inception, we create and maintain a transparent quality assurance process which involves clinical validation to guarantee the data being used to train the AI algorithms is accurate for diagnosis and treating disease. This training data is based on a balanced cohort of people of different ages, genders, and ethnicities, thus ensuring we develop reliable, accurate, and unbiased AI algorithms that are reflective of the patient populations that they will be applied towards. The patient journey is at the heart of Siemens Health and Ears AI work, and AI has the ability to help improve care and outcomes for the patient. AI helps patients undergoing a CT scan for lung cancer screening by optimizing the resulting generating images while minimizing the time the patient spends in the scanner. Radiologists reviewing those images can utilize our AI-guided computer software as a companion to identify small nodules and other suspicious abnormalities that they pr previously weren't able to visualize without the assistance of AI. Suspicious lung nodules diagnosed to be cancerous by the clinician can potentially be treated by radiation therapy, which includes the very tedious task of manually drawing these unique contours of the cancerous tumor to target radiation while preserving healthy tissue. 
Our AI-enabled auto contouring software can automatically detect these contours of the cancerous area, significantly speeding up the patient's time to treatment and potentially eliminating unwarranted radiation. At Siemens Health and Years, commercial AI algorithms have gone through a regulatory approval process with the FDA. We follow all AI ML enabled medical device regulatory requirements for the pre-market review and post-market surveillance to ensure the safety and efficacy of our devices. We believe with the rapid acceleration in development and innovation of AI medical devices, the need for regulatory environment to be able to have be balanced in innovation and adoption is going to be critical. While we believe the current regulatory framework is sufficient to support innovation in AI, we support the continuation of flexibility in the approval process, as well as efforts to facilitate global harmonization and the development of appropriate international consensus standards. While CMS has recognized the value and the complex nature of AI, the agency's reimbursement decisions have not uniformly and consistently ensured appropriate levels of payment for these AI products. This inconsistent, unpredictable approach stifles adoption and limits access to patients benefiting from AI technologies across our healthcare system, especially in rural and underserved areas. We support a solution that ensures a predictable and consistent approach to CMS, an approach that recognizes the costs of AI and reimburses AI analysis with a temporary and separate payment system until more data can be evaluated. Siemens Health and Ears believes AI has the greatest potential to improve access to care, diagnose disease faster, and enable <coughs> physicians to make more precise treatment decisions. As a market leader, we are excited to see what the future holds for AI and healthcare. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Dr. Longer, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning. And thank you, Chairs Rogers and Guthrie, Ranking Members Pallone and Eshoo, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak with you today about our experience at UC San Diego Health using machine learning and AI models to improve healthcare delivery. My name is Chris Longhurst. I'm a practicing pediatrician, and I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Digital Officer, and Associate Dean at UC San Diego Health. At our institution, we've been carefully evaluating and implementing machine learning models to enhance quality and safety for over five years, and we believe our experience can be helpful as the committee considers the implications of healthcare AI. As a leader at the intersection of care delivery and technology, it has been disappointing to see so little progress in patient safety over the last two decades, with a recent study from Boston suggesting that one in four patients admitted to the hospital, hospital continue to experience an adverse event, many of which are preventable. Healthcare organizations are complex socio-technical systems, and these new AI tools may be the key to finally bending the patient safety curve in a better direction. One instructive example of our use of this technology at UCSD arose early in the pandemic. Because Marine Corps Air Station Miramar served as one of the first two sites for evacuation of Wuhan expatriates, we hospitalized some of the first COVID patients in the country back in February 2020. This early experience led us to broadly deploy an imaging AI tool, which helped identify COVID pneumonia on chest x-rays. Remember, this is months before widespread testing became available. We published the results of our outcomes evaluation, which showed that this tool impacted clinical decision making for one in five patients in our emergency department over the course of the summer of 2020. However, after processing over 60,000 chest x-rays, we turned the tool off at the end of 2020 because it was no longer useful to our clinicians when testing became ubiquitous, which demonstrates the importance of ongoing monitoring to ensure that AI tools continue to be both safe and effective. The study was recently cited in a review of all research about COVID and AI, which found our publication was one of, was one of just four out of over 9,000 which actually demonstrated an impact on clinical outcomes. This demonstrates another key point, which is the huge gap between the creation of algorithms and the actual implementation and measurement to benefit patients, what we refer to as the AI hype cycle. A second instructive example comes from our use of AI to support earlier identification and treatment of a blood infection called sepsis. UC San Diego has chosen to develop a, a local model using local data, and we even trained it to tell our users, I don't know, when predictive confidence was low. This was implemented with significant clinical process redesign, such as notifying a central team and not just the frontline clinicians. The results have been associated with a decreased risk of death among patients with sepsis in our emergency department. 
And this case study highlights the importance of not only creating these algorithms, but ensuring the algorithms are transparent in their predictions to generate trust, and doing the hard work then of integrating these into clinical workflows where they can impact meaningful outcomes and care quality. A final example is our recent use of generative AI to help our busy clinicians answer patient messages, which have reached unprecedented levels with the rise in virtual care. UC San Diego authors published a study earlier this year showing generative AI could draft high quality and empathetic responses to patient questions, perhaps even higher quality than some physician responses. On the tail of these results, UCSD became one of the first sites in the nation to implement generative AI to help our clinicians respond to patient messages. But importantly, we chose to ensure full transparency with our patients by ensuring every message has an addendum disclosing that this message was automatically generated and reviewed by your doctor. These messages cannot be sent to patients without a clinician review, and our preliminary results have shown this has been well received by clinicians and patients and may save cognitive burden. This case study illustrates the importance of both transparency and keeping a human in the loop at all times. Now, from a privacy and security perspective, I want to note that in all three cases, no protected health information has left our HIPAA-protected environment. In fact, we recently founded the first Center for Healthcare Cybersecurity with an ARPA-H grant and uh, a focus on continuing to improve our digital protections uh, and resiliency. So to summarize, as a health system engaged in the procurement, development, and use of large-scale machine learning models that can perform a wide variety of tasks, uh, we commit to pursuing these technologies benefits while mitigating their risks and protecting patient privacy. For almost five years, our Health AI Committee has been evaluating all machine learning models proposed for implementation from an ethical and eth health equity framework to ensure safety, security, and trust, which is well aligned with the model proposed by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT to ensure fair, appropriate, valid, effective, and safe use of AI, or FAVE. Now, while some advocate for a centralized testing process, our experience suggests that local audits could be more effective in the hospital setting for sure ensuring alignment with these principles, as these models must be evaluated within the context of the care they support. Um, finally, with the generous support of Joan and Erwin Jacobs uh, Center for Health Innovation, we see an opportunity for moving this uh, industry forward together, engaging with you and the administration on responsible AI use. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your opening statement. And the chair now recognizes Dr. Newman Toker. Five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Eshoo, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address Congress on this critically important topic of artificial intelligence and healthcare. My name is David Newman Toker, and I'm a physician scientist with doctoral level training in public health and a research focus on improving medical diagnosis, including the development and deployment of novel diagnostic technologies such as AI. I've been a faculty member at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine for more than two decades, where I'm currently a professor of neurology and director of our AHRQ-funded Center for Diagnostic Excellence. I'm also past president of the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. My testimony today will focus on opportunities and challenges for AI and healthcare from a public health perspective, with a special emphasis on AI to improve medical diagnosis. I would like to state for the record that the opinions I express here today in my written testimony are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Johns Hopkins University. AI is the branch of computer science concerned with endowing computers with the ability to simulate intelligent human behavior. The most complex cognitive task in medicine is the act of diagnosing the cause of a patient's symptoms. Errors in diagnosis account for an estimated 800,000 deaths or permanent disabilities each year in the U.S., more than 80 percent of which are associated with cognitive errors or clinical reasoning failures. This creates a unique quality improvement opportunity for AI-based systems to save American lives at public health scale. Potential benefits of AI include better health outcomes for patients at lower costs, greater access to and an efficiency of care delivery, especially for those currently underserved and disadvantaged, and decreased health care costs, uh, decreased health care uh, healthcare workforce burnout. However, none of these benefits will be realized without tackling foundational data challenges facing AI. The rate limiting step for developing and implementing AI systems in healthcare is no longer the technology. It is the sources of data on which the technology must be trained. <clears throat> there are three critical data problems. First, using data that are wrong, often called the garbage in, garbage out problem. Second, relying on the wrong kinds of data, sometimes called the looking where the light is best problem. And third, not having the right kinds of data at all, especially health outcomes such as inaccurate diagnoses, unexpected adverse events, or reduced quality of life. Data quality in healthcare is non-uniform, even for diagnosis. The most reliable and complete digital data sets exist in radiology and laboratory medicine. Here, good AI diagnostic systems are already being built. At le the least reliable and most incomplete digital data are from routine clinical encounters. 
Key details about patient symptoms or clinical examination findings in the electronic health record are often missing or inaccurate. Here, good AI diagnostic systems must wait for a radical shift in the way we capture diagnostic information about patients. AI systems that learn on faulty data will generally make the same mistakes that humans make. Put simply, if available electronic health record data sets are used to train AI systems, the best we can hope for is AI systems which replicate and formalize implicit human biases, and the worst we can expect is AI systems that are frequently wrong in their recommendations. If AI-based systems are deployed without adequate testing, the quality of healthcare will drop. The biggest public health gains from well-designed AI can reasonably be expected in parts of the healthcare system where there are large quality gaps that could be closed for many individuals. Diagnostic errors, lack of access to care in underserved areas, and health disparities. For AI and healthcare to maximally benefit the health of all Americans, the following are essential. First, AI systems must be trained on gold standard data sets that are unbiased and include complete information on both clinical inputs and care outputs. Second, AI systems must be effectively integrated into clinical workflows, leveraging the strengths of computers and humans together to produce a better result than could be achieved by either alone. And third, wherever AI is used, systems to monitor, maintain, and even enhance clinician skills, including diagnostic ones, should be co-deployed so that clinicians and AI systems will continue to fact check each other. I have three primary policy recommendations for the committee. First, AI systems must be held to a high regulatory standard. They must be demonstrated scientifically to improve care quality over current care. Second, new payment incentives will be needed to ensure AI systems are unbiased and health outcomes are being monitored. Special incentives will likely be needed for AI-based diagnostic tools, since diagnosis is generally unaffected by current disease-based payment models. And third, targeted research funding to address known barriers is essential. Special consideration should be given to funding programs that support development of large gold standard data sets from which high quality AI systems for diagnosis can be trained. In summary, AI has great potential to transform healthcare for the better, but absent carefully crafted regulations, innovative payment incentives, and targeted research resources, risks will dominate. The guiding principle for policy changes should be public health impact, including an emphasis on the equitable distribution of benefits and risks across the population. Thank you for this opportunity. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. That concludes opening statements for all witnesses. I'll just kind of say this generically because I know, I think Dr. Wynn, you said this is your first trip to D.C., so I know you haven't testified before, so welcome to our nation, all of you, is that you guys have a lot of information and we have a lot of curiosity. So each of us are going to get five minutes, and so I know there's going to be hard to answer some of your questions succinctly. <laughs> But if one of us say, I'm sorry, well, I'm going to move to the next question because we have things we want to get to. We're not being rude. We just want to make the best of our five minutes. So I'll say that uh, moving forward. And there are some of my colleagues, some more than others, they'll ask you a, a really detailed question with the five seconds left in their time. So I'll let you answer as much as we can. But if I gather you down, it's not being rude. It's getting things done so we can appreciate your time as well. So I'll say that, and I'll begin uh, the, by, uh, the five minutes by recognizing myself for five minutes for questions. <laughs> So, Dr. Wynn, you mentioned in your testimony the various types of AI and how generative AI is often the focus. Can you walk us through how you might deploy the various forms of AI, supervise, unsupervised, reinforce? And if these aren't the main drivers of how you deploy AI, then please walk me through your approach. Absolutely. Um, so, I think it's very helpful to think about AI at a high level in uh, two different categories. One is, uh, I'll call it narrow AI, right? These are narrow specialized AI tools. And uh, they typically are built to do very specialized, very specific jobs, and they're very good at those if we train them well and uh, train out bias, right? Um, tools like this are things such as a uh, predictor tool, right, to predict the risk of uh, a cardiac event in a patient, right? Now, that's a narrow type of AI, right? You want to apply those types of narrow AI systems when you have high risk, right, uh, highly important tasks, right, that you must get right. So things such as supporting diagnoses, right, making predictions on a patient's deterioration, um, right, those are what you want those narrow systems are for. The other half, right, and this is a little newer, these kinds of systems are more in the news, are generative AI systems. These systems are much more flexible. They are not built for specific specialized tasks. Um, you see them most often in technologies like the very well-known chatbot, ChatGBT. Um, they are built to be very flexible, right? They are built to do things like take uh, language as input and 
output uh, written language in response, right? They are very good at flexible tasks, like assisting with uh, administrative burden, right? Uh, generating educational content, right? These are tasks where you need the flexibility, right? Uh, rather than the specialized uh, nature of the other systems. And so those are the two ways. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. And Mr. Shen, I'll move to you. Um, for health uh, care, especially ensuring that patients, there are guardrails in place for AI. We wanna make sure we protect patient safety while promoting better outcomes and safeguarding taxpayer dollars. So my question is, how do you believe we can strike the proper regulatory balance on the front end to ensure there are safeguards in place without stifling the innovation and the growth of AI? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, for, as it relates to our, our work with the FDA, our algorithms as go through a regulatory process with the FDA. We follow all the AI machine learning enabled medical device regulatory requirements for both pre-market review and post-market surveillance to make sure that those solutions are safe for patients and effective uh, for them as well. We also have regular dialogue with the FDA regarding AI and machine learning and provide feedbacks on ways that they can ensure the continued safe and effective application of these technologies. I think also what is a great example is that we worked uh, very closely with the FDA on the implementation of the predetermined change control plans for AI, and I thank this committee as well for their support in this particular effort. Those help us ensure that we can continue to innovate in this, in this area while having the right regulatory uh, uh, components in place. At the same time, I think where the challenge is right now um, is around adoption of artificial intelligence and for providers and physicians to take advantage of all the great benefits that myself and the other colleagues here have, have talked about here. Right now, again, CMS really needs to create kind of a consistent and predictable approach for the payment of, of these AI solutions that are FDA approved, rather than the current ad hoc approach that we've seen to date, where certain technologies receive a separate payment based on manufactured supply costs, but other ones don't receive that payment. That confusion leads to to uncertainty for providers as to whether they should actually make an investment into artificial intelligence. And unfortunately, because of that uncertainty, the patients get lost in, in terms of their ability to take advantage of these technologies. Okay, thank you. And I wanna move a question to Dr. Newman Toker. Um, some of my concerns is, as we're looking at all the data that goes into to AI, some of the, what we, what we need to be aware of of what could come out of, so the regulatory and policy challenges that we need to consider. I guess an example would be, uh, to make sure, we, we've talked about quality adjusted life years on, in, on this subcommittee quite often, and, and we want to make sure that you know, a, a data system isn't just to factor that in to see if people are qualified for care. So how do, how, what are the kind of the unforeseen challenges that you think we need to be aware of moving forward, that being an example? There are significant data challenges for um, AI systems, particularly where w when we look at uh, clinical data. So for example, there, there are great data in uh, laboratory and imaging uh, data sets that are digitized. The clinical data, which are in electronic notes, actually have lots of errors and problems in them. And I do think that to some extent, that's a, a key focal point where we should be making sure that we're not over-relying on faulty data sources in order to, as we as we try to move forward to AI okay. systems that are helping us. Yeah, I didn't leave you much time to answer, so thanks for that. And we'll, hopefully we can explore that more through this hearing or, and, or through in writing Absolutely. as we move forward. So I'll yield back and I will recognize the ranking member for five minutes for her questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each one of you, our witnesses today. Um, as I was listening, um, I was listening hard, you know, to absorb uh, what you were saying. And um, I, I have to admit uh, that there were different parts of your testimony where I really didn't understand what you were talking about. That, that's not, you know, uh, uh, to be interpreted as um, you being less than perfect. I mean, that's a it's condition for the entire of humanity. But... Um, I think that we're really very hungry to hear in uh, pedestrian terms, if you'll excuse that, uh, that uh, terminology, exactly how this is going to work and how you think it's working now. Um, 
I recall the book uh, written by, uh, by John Doerr. I think all of you know who he is. If you don't, uh, on the committee, Google him because he's uh, one of the great minds of our country. But the, uh, the uh, title of the book was Measure What Matters. And that's what I'm trying to extract from your testimony. I don't know if some of this is meant for administrators. I mean, we talk about administrative burden. What does that mean? I mean, what, what is AI going to do about that? What does it mean in terms of patients at their bedside? At their, I mean, in real life, not only important information that medical specialists can have access to, to enlarge their understanding, as uh, as you said, uh, uh, Dr. Longhurst, and so wonderful that you uh, took everything, all the your experience at Lucille, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh, to UC. Uh, they are first cousins, right? Stanford and University of California. Uh, so my my questions are are really more about um, uh, the practical. The real practical uh, um, advantages of AI. I mean, I would ask just the entire panel if you can answer this uh, without any um, congressional uh, statutes yet. <coughs> how do you guarantee the uh, uh, all the positives that? Uh, that you presented to us today. Yeah, yeah just now. briefly, but yeah. yeah. To, to, to I mean, because you're all, you're all saying that this is, and I believe in the potential of this, but I think that we need to um, think long and hard about how this is actually going to work. Yeah. So you're doing it right now, and uh, with um, your with your systems. Let me see if I can briefly give you a very yeah. factual answer. So. When we say administrative burden, we're talking about the anywhere between 25 and 50 percent of time during a day that a clinician, a doctor, a nurse spends on activities that don't directly relate to patient care. They're entering data into a system. They're searching for data in multiple different systems. They're bringing all that information together. They're writing it down. They're organizing it. They're communicating with other physicians, with pharmacy, with the other departments in the hospital. All of that just so they can have the right information and be able to make good decisions for their patients. That's a space that AI, in particular large language models, is almost custom built for, where it can become an assistant. So is it, it, are you using it today? Yeah. And, and, and <coughs> uh, having measured what matters, what's the outcome? Yeah. What are your doctors saying? Does so, it reduce their burdens by... 50%, 20%, 5%, what, what are they saying? So they for, our, for our ER doctors, for example, that are using this to help with their documentation, yeah, they're, they're seeing, you know, at upwards of 20, 30% of their time returned to them so that they can focus on patients, so they can spend more time with the patient, communicating with the patient, and not having to do the documentation themselves. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think there's, there's an important distinction to be made between the direct benefits of AI to patient health and the sort of indirect benefits. What we've been discussing is sort of the indirect benefit indirect, of, right. of having mm -hmm. additional time with, mm -hmm. you know, less time for clinicians spent on, on mm -hmm. unnecessary tasks and more time spent on the, the task at hand of taking care of the patient. I think the future of AI that, that we, we want to look towards is one where AI is actually helping improve health for patients directly through, for example, the prevention of medical errors. Absolutely. By improving uh -huh. the accuracy of diagnoses uh -huh. and uh, the Im improving the accuracy of the application of correct treatments, avoiding adverse events from mistakes made in, in the delivery of healthcare. And I think those are the kinds of things that you're getting at when it, you talk about measures that matter. We want to improve patient health through Is AI. it happening now? I would say that it's not happening uh, at that level as yet, but it's a place where we need to focus our attention. Mm -hmm. Well, you all are going to get my uh, specific other questions <coughs> that I had planned to ask, but went right off script. So uh, thank you for your testimony today and for, you know, the expertise that you're bringing to this. Uh, we need it, and uh, I, I hope that um, you would all weigh in in some way, shape, or form about the CREATE Act. I'd like to know uh, where you are on that. I think it's... Uh, 
uh, important for us to pass it. Thank you again. Thank the general lady yields back. Chair recognizes Chair Rogers for five minutes for her questions. Dr. Schussler, as you may know, this committee has worked on a national data privacy standard, and I believe that that's the first step that Congress should take as we think through the guardrails that are needed in regard to artificial intelligence. Your testimony states the importance of data privacy in using and developing AI in healthcare. Would you share any comments on this issue and the importance of privacy in artificial intelligence? Yeah, uh, privacy is critical uh, to, uh, to everything we do with patient data, uh, even prior to the advent of artificial intelligence. And as a healthcare provider, we've been operating under the HIPAA standard now for decades, and I think that's actually given, given us a great roadmap to understand how to do a, a really good job in protecting our patients' data. AI strategy is a data strategy. It, the, the two are intrinsically linked, and so we need good quality data, diverse data sources, large data sets to train and fine tune these models. And so we have to think about both sides of this, which is how do we keep the data private and secure, which I 100% agree we need to, but also do it in a way that enables us to use the data to train these models to get smarter, to get better. If we want to achieve the outcomes my colleagues and I have mentioned, um, the data is the fuel for that. So we, we completely agree that, a, uh, that data has to be kept private and secure. We obviously would be uh, happy to work with the committee and yourself on, uh, on the approach to data privacy you mentioned in that act. Um, but I would just add that I, I think as a provider, we have a lot of deep experience in how to do this uh, and a lot of insight into how to do this well. And AI now is just another software application that we have to put under that umbrella of HIPAA so we make sure that we continue to protect our patients' data the way we have. Thank you. Mr. Shin, recognizing the growing interest in medical products that incorporate AI, it's critical that FDA keeps pace with how these innovative technologies are being utilized and the benefit and risk involved. FDA must ensure patients and providers have timely access to safe and effective products while facilitating innovation by providing industry with predictable regulatory pathways and rules of the road. Can you discuss how FDA's current regulatory process works for AI-enabled medical technologies and are there any improvements in mind? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Chairwoman. So for as it relates to the FDA, the FDA actually provides several different pathways for a AI solution to go get their, their regulatory approval. And these, these pathways include different rigors that are available there to be able to prove for organizations to prove that they're, that they're both ethical, safe, and secure in terms of how they're treating the patient data, and then also how that application is going to be applied towards the patient population going forward. So in fact, the, the way that the construct that the FDA has today actually provides good ways for how software can be updated and AI algorithms can be updated going forward. Um, where we see some of the challenges as it relates to regulation is, is not in terms of the approval of FDA solutions, but as mentioned earlier, the adoption of these FDA solutions and leveraging things like, like CMS to be able to provide ways to encourage adoption of AI solutions amongst the different providers that are mentioned here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask each of you in the time remaining um, to speak to this question because AI is being used in different fields to improve healthcare for patients and, and we hear the examples of improved diagnostics, better care for providers, and as we move forward and continue to incorporate AI in healthcare, it's going to be important to make sure that providers and patients are aware when decisions involve AI. So just starting uh, with Dr. Schussler, would you um, just speak to what Congress should be con thinking about in this regard as we to make sure that it isn't lost as AI technology cont continues to evolve? Well, I would, uh, I would comment that transparency is incredibly important when it comes to AI uh, in general across all use cases that patients and providers uh, deserve to be uh, to understand exactly when AI is being used, what data sets were used to train it, what decisions it's being enabled to make. Um, I think that's foundational to an AI strategy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wynn? Absolutely. I think it's of the paramount, the most paramount importance that patients always have the right to understand who is treating them um, and if AI is involved, right? Okay. There must be transparency around the use of those tools. Providers as well must understand the limitations of those tools. Okay. Mr. Shin? 
Yeah, I would add to the transparency topic. It's not only transparency in terms of how the AI is created, but also transparency in terms of understanding how the AI has derived its clinical decision. So being able to educate the, mm. the users of the AI to understand how is the AI actually making this, this clinical decision or clinical recommendation. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Unfortunately, my uh, time has expired, uh, so I'll have to look for another opportunity to get the input from the rest of you. Thanks, I yield back. Thank you, the chair yields back and the chair recognizes the ranking member for five minutes for opening for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my questions initially are Dr. Longhurst. I'm concerned that the rapid deployment of AI tools means that there's an enormous incentive to collect, use, and share vast quantities of patient and other consumers' health information to train AI models, and this raises serious privacy and data security concerns, particularly as it relates to data collected and transferred outside of the HIPAA-related uh, regulated environment. So do you share my concerns uh, in this respect, um, and particularly uh, potential sale of health data by third parties, including mobile applications, and that that's not sufficiently regulated under any federal privacy law, including HIPAA? Thank you, Ranking Member Pallone, for the uh, great question. We absolutely share your concern. As Dr. Schlosser uh, just described in his uh, uh, points, commitment to transparency is key. Transparency requires privacy. Health systems and payers who have been subject to HIPAA for over two decades now understand what that means. But these third-party apps that are collecting health information directly from consumers are not today subject to HIPAA, and that is deeply concerning to uh, us as an industry that there are growing databases of patient data provided, in many cases by patients themselves, that will be unwittingly and inadvertently used for other purposes. All right, so let me ask you, in your testimony, you mentioned several examples of AI tools used at the University of California at San Diego. Do you know what data was used to train those tools, and was it all data pr protected? Yeah, thank you again for another great question. The first two examples I gave about imaging and sepsis were absolutely tools created with our own data sets about the patients that we serve. They were created in a HIPAA protected environment and our protected health information never left that environment. The third example I shared was the generative AI using uh, these tools to help respond to, to messages. This was a general tool that is not accessing our patients' protected health information, is not being trained on our patients' uh, data, and it does exist in our HIPAA-protected environment. So in all three cases, they are subject to uh, HIPAA regulations. But as you point out, these third-party uh, consumer apps which collect data directly from patients are building databases and creating algorithms without that level of transparency or data protection. Well, thank you. Let me go to Dr. Shen from Siemens. You've testified about the vast amounts of medical data needed to train the tools, the AI tools that Siemens is creating. Is all the consumer data that you use to train those tools regulated under HIPAA? Yeah, thank you for the question, Ranking Member Pallone. So at Siemens Health and Years, we're deeply committed to safeguarding patient data and data privacy upon upholding the data protection standards that are set forth by HIPAA. I think it's essential to recognize that the data that's utilized to train these algorithms goes through a rigorous process of de-identification. So we actually use methods to remove all personal identifiable information or PII and any protected health information as well. And that's all done prior to doing any sort of AI algorithm training. And that ensures that all of that data security and privacy is respected for that patient. Well, you mentioned the importance of the strong data security. So elaborate a little bit on why it's important, particularly in the context of consumers' sensitive <coughs> health care data, if you will. Yeah, ab absolutely. Another great follow-up question, Ranking Member Pallone. So what's, what's very critical here is making sure that, that we, want to, we want to make sure that we have a, a healthy data set that's, that's utilized to train these algorithms. But at the same time, we have to recognize and respect the data privacy and the, and the patient confidentiality that's been established between the patient and the provider themselves. So when we work with our clinical partners to, to utilize data for algorithm training, we respect that, those, those legal constructs that are already in place with the different providers that are there. On top of that, what we do within Siemens Health and Ears is we also make sure we double check that the data that we receive that has been said to be de-identified, we double check that that data is truly de-identified. So we go through the extra rigor to make sure that that data has been 
removed of all any, any PII or PHI that's there. Let me just thank you. Just quickly, only 30 seconds, but Dr. Newman talk, uh, Toker, what, what do you recommend on how AI developers can proactively identify and mitigate potential biases uh, to prevent unintentional perpetuation of racial disparities in healthcare algorithms? 15 sure. seconds. <laughs> um, I'll just say that there, you know, there are reasonable questions about how best to address genetic differences in human physiology that may correspond to macroscopic racial groups. But one thing's clear, we, we should not be converting human racial biases into hard and fast AI determined rules. I think that's a critical uh, uh, feature and it's going to require that we adopt larger data sets that are represented, representative of all the population with oversampling for minorities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. And I know we had a markup since, uh, and we were able to talk a little bit, but Dr. Burgess also has announced he's not running for re-election. And I, I will say on our side of the aisle, probably in the entire Congress, there's nobody that has a more encyclopedic knowledge of health care policy, uh, but more important of his just ability to absorb the facts and move forward is his passion for making sure that the health care system works the best and his compassion that it works for people that, that have the least ability to make it work for themselves. And uh, someone who's become a dear friend of mine and somebody I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And we have another year, but we are absolutely going to have an empty seat at this table next year from somebody who is, is so good at what he does. So, Dr. Burgess, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for those kind remarks, probably kinder than I deserved. When you look at AI in the in the context of the existing ecosystem, if I can use that word in healthcare, it's not new and it's not unique. We've all had some experience with it, and like anything in healthcare, there's rarely a day that goes by, or there is never a day that occurs where someone comes into me and says, "You know, I don't think we're regulated enough in healthcare." So I want to balance those two things. Um, but we do need to be sensitive in finding a balance when we discuss improving the regulatory process and make sure that innovation is not clobbered in the process. So let me ask Dr. Slosher and, and Mr. Shen uh, both this question. If you could dis discuss the importance of clarifying the role of AI as a support tool rather than a primary factor in decision making and sort of extrapolate on what makes this distinction so significant in practice. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think this is an incredibly important distinction. The, the concept of human in the loop, which I mentioned in my testimony, I think is a critical safeguard that we can use that will allow us to accelerate the use of AI and learn more about the capabilities of these tools, in particular, these new versions of AI, the large language models, but do it in such a way that we still have a trusted physician or clinician between that AI model and the patient who ultimately is impacted. So the, the tool becomes an assistant that can provide decision support, advice, summarize data, bring new insights, but we rely on that physician or clinician to be the ultimate decision maker for that patient. And I think that gives us a level of safety that will allow us to continue to experiment and understand how to use AI uh, going into the future. Very good. Mr. Shin? Yeah. Thank you, Congressman Burgess. And just to echo what Dr. Schlesher said, we also believe that artificial intelligence is here to be a companion for the clinician. So we, we fully understand the value of the patient-clinician or the patient-doctor relationship there. And what we want the AI to do here for that clinician is to provide more information, more context for that clinician to make that more informed diagnostic decision or that more personalized treatment decision for the patient. So we're not looking for AI to actually replace what that clinician is trying to do from a diagnosis or therapeutic standpoint, but actually to help inform that clinician to, be, to make that more informed diagnostic decision or that more personalized treatment decision. We don't have time to get into it in this hearing, but I also hope, and I may ask you this to respond in writing, where the technology will lead to long-term savings. Because of course, we have to be concerned about the debt deficit and the healthcare spend is one of the primary drivers there. But Mr. Shen, staying with you, what has your experience been like? And I, I know uh, Chairman Guthrie asked you this a little bit, but you got to work with Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and they make coverage determinations and reimbursement determinations. So how's that been working out for you? Yeah, I, we, we, we've been working very cl closely with, with, with CMS. 
to try to determine again what is the appropriate uh, reimbursement as it relates to artificial intelligence. And I think where we see the biggest concern again is around the adoption of these AI solutions. And what we're hearing from providers and from physicians is that they're, they have this strong desire to want to adopt these AI solutions because of all the great benefits that we've talked about here this morning. The challenge again is that the uncertainty on whether they, if they make an investment in AI, the uncertainty on whether they, they will receive any reimbursement or not coming back for that, for that investment. There's just inconsistency coming from yeah. CMS today. Yeah. This is a safe space. You can talk about CMS all you want. We won't tell a soul. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Wynn, let me just ask you, uh, Dr. Schlosser went into some detail in his written testimony about the large language model that he's using, and then you talked about a generative model for large language models, and I just wonder if it's possible to set down the patient interaction in iambic pentameter, which after all is the language of Shakespeare. That's what you referenced in your written yeah. testimony. Yes, just to clarify, uh, are, are you asking if it is possible to set, to set down the patient experience in iambic pentameter using these models? Well, I was just intrigued by your statement, using the language of Shakespeare. So let's focus a little bit on drug development. Is there a place where this can play a role in drug development? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, drug development is a very complex process, right, in involving many moving parts. Um, there are many ways in which AI can but, be used. But some of those are predictable at the level of the FDA. So as far as collecting the data that you're going to need to submit, the timeliness of the submission, Absolutely. it seems like that AI would be a place where that could be organized. And exactly. If something's going to fail, maybe it could fail a little earlier and save everyone some time and trouble. Exactly. Selection of uh, population data synthesis, administrating of the study, right, and the busy work around that are very clearly things that AI could assist in uh, reducing the burden on. Well, I thank you all for being here today. Very informative panel, and we're not done with this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Cardenas. The gentleman from California, Mr. Cardenas, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chair Guthrie and Ranking Member Eshoo, for holding this timely hearing, and, and thank you to our witnesses for sharing your expertise and your opinions. Uh, emerging AI technologies show an incredible promise to improve and plug gaps in our existing healthcare system, uh, ecosystem. Many of you have already mentioned that these novel technologies have the potential to expand healthcare access, address outstanding disparities, and support the healthcare workforce. I've, I've been clear in my support for advancing technologies that increase access and quality of care for all Americans, but there's also the potential for harm if uh, we are not intentional about how to proceed forward. AI should make healthcare systems more equitable, not less equitable. And because AI is only as good as the data it trains on, or I worry about the possibility that these technologies may perpetuate or even widen existing health disparities. We have a responsibility to ensure AI innovation in healthcare is developed carefully and reliably if we truly want to harness its full potential. I have a question for uh, Dr. Newman Toker. Um, Dr. Newman, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that those in rural or underserved communities or those with social determinants of health associated with generally worse health outcomes may be most susceptible to suffering adverse consequences of inadequately regulated AI systems. Can you expand on the kinds of consequences we have already seen? Uh, yes, obviously we, we have populations that are at risk. These are individuals who do not necessarily have good access to healthcare in the first place. And on the positive side, we hope that AI will offer the opportunity to deliver higher quality care, greater access to expertise. On the downside, there are obviously concerns about whether AI systems will either be accessible to those individuals at all. Uh, for example, there, there may be uh, uh, broadband access problems or other issues that constrain their ability to even access technologies, even if they're, they're broadly available. And we have further issues about health literacy, the ability to use such tools, and beyond that, the issue of whether uh, when AI systems do potentially fail or make errors, uh, they may be less <coughs> equipped to be able to deal with those problems. Thank you. Uh, what should Congress keep in mind as we look to AI to improve health equity and protect against worsening disparities? Yes, go ahead. I appreciate your question. Um, 
We've talked uh, uh, on this panel about the importance of transparency, and some of our vendor colleagues talked about submitting to the FDA the results of internal testing. But it's important for this uh, subcommittee to recognize those are all self-reported tests. And so the Coalition for Health AI, or CHI, has recently proposed a series of national labs that would serve as testing beds for vendor-supplied uh, AI algorithms. I think that's something that should be reviewed in more detail because having an external testing is the way that we're going to mitigate these health equity kind of issues that come up from algorithms developed on biased data sets. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about we've seen in the past with uh, incredible innovations that make it easier for people to make conclusions. Uh, for example, uh, back in the day when the term credit score didn't even exist, um, I was told at the time when I said, wait a minute, you're going to use this as the, not the backdrop, but you're going to use this as a primary driver of who is going to get access to capital across America and now across the world. And they said, no, 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 it's just a side tool. No, it is now the main tool. The old days of having a big file and, and having a whole review before they make a decision is gone. But my point is this, they are proprietary algorithms. The government of the United States doesn't even have a clue what those algorithms are. Nobody does but the actual proprietor, and it's protected. And I respect that protection because they've done a lot and invested much into that. So it, it, it is, in fact, proprietary, but the problem is this. Nobody knows what's happening in that black box. That's one of my concerns with AI, especially when it comes to not only quality of life, but whether or not who lives or dies based on an algorithm's decision as to what is going to be the outcome or the cure, or if someone is even going to get access to health care because they say, no, yours is not an emergency situation, so therefore you're not going to get cared for. Uh, we 100 percent agree with you. We see the uh, increasing rate of denials of uh, payer claims, and we know that that's being driven in part by AI processing these claims and very rapidly denying them in an inequitable way, and so we share your concerns. Well, we already have concerns. We already have uh, examples, and I hope that we in Congress actually do our job and actually try to move hopefully as fast as AI has in order to make uh, a better future for us. Sorry that I went over my time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes Mr. Gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Ladder, for five minutes. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our panel for being, witness for being witnesses today. I tell you, it's very, very important because uh, AI is something that I applaud our chairwoman of the full committee uh, through, through all of our subcommittees that we've been having hearings on AI and how important this issue is as we go forward especially when we're talking about on the healthcare side, because this is uh, especially technology that we do have to put those guardrails in place, making sure that we protect the privacy of Americans and also prevent other countries, especially countries like China, from abusing it. Also in this subcommittee, it's also been interesting through the years, and it's been brought up in, the, in your discussion today. Again, we were trying to help the providers out there being able to do what they're supposed to do. You know, we have a shortage of health care providers. The docs uh, uh, that we've had before today, when I've asked some que questions, I, I remember one panel especially, I said, I think about as many of us at this table today, I said, how, many you spend, how much time are you spending actually seeing your patients? And I don't think one of them said more than 50%. And so when you have a, a shortage of doctors out there and nurses and everyone else, it's important that uh, they're doing that job that's actually essential to get it done. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Newman Toker, in 2021, more than 100 drug and biologic applications included AI and machine learning components. Would you explain to the subcommittee, if we continue to explore AI, how this could lead to further breakthrough developments? Um, thank you, Congressman, for the, the question. Uh, what I would say is that as we look to the space of, uh, of drug development, you, you can imagine in the same way as in general with healthcare, that there are opportunities for AI to help both in, uh, in the process itself, uh, that is the, the mechanics of, of working your way through the regulatory process, as well as through the identification process of actual uh, treatments. So for example, if we have large data sets that allow us to identify drug therapies that are uh, available to us, then I think that that will um, give us an opportunity to, to break new ground using existing data architectures. Yeah, well, thank you very much. 
Uh, Dr. Schlosser, when I was reading your testimony, it was kind of interesting. I got a question because I thought it's kind of interesting when you, uh, the technology uses the ambient speech models to, tr to transcribe the uh, doctor patient interactions into text in emergency rooms. And because, uh, you know, we all have the opportunity to visit our hospitals, and uh, especially because being on the subcommittee, I, I go through a lot of different emergency rooms, and you know you, the stress that happens there. How, I'm curious. Because of the stress and everything that's there, how does the, the technology eliminate that stress to make sure you're getting the perfect, absolutely 100% of what you've got to have to be transcribed for that patient? Yeah, well, I'll, and thank you for the question. And I'll go back to a comment I've made several times now, which is the, the human in the loop, and that uh, we always have the physician and their opportunity to review the note as that last step before it would ever become part of the electronic health record so that they can ensure that it is 100% accurate. The AI is not at the point yet where it can do that completely on its own. We're using the data through uh, data sharing agreements to continue to improve the quality of the AI and it continues to get better and better, which means it saves them more and more time. They have to do less editing at the end of the event. Um, but right now we do need those physicians to still be vigilant. Um, as you identified, the emergency room is a chaotic and challenging environment. That's actually why we took that technology there in the first place. We feel like it has the most to offer in that space where precious time given back to the physician so they can really tune in to what's going on with that patient will actually yield meaningful quality results. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Longhurst, uh, you said something interesting in your te uh, testimony. Uh, you said that we have to have the ethical review of AI. Would you just delve into that ethical review of AI a little bit more, please? Yeah. So our Health AI Committee, which has been around for some years, is staffed by legal and compliance and risk management and clinicians. It's co-chaired by several of our internal medicine physicians. It includes health equity researchers and bioethicists. And the reason for that is to look at things like what is the ethics of being transparent in this case? Is that uh, an ethically appropriate thing to do or um, are there ethically challenged questions? And so that actually helped to raise for us when we uh, first implemented generative AI to help our clinicians respond to patient messages. That question was raised by our ethicists, should we be transparent with our patients? And that generated the conversation that resulted in full transparency to our patients about the fact that we we're using generative AI to help with our responses, even though there's still a human in the loop, even though those messages are still edited by clinicians at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize Dr. Ruiz from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our healthcare system is strained by widespread healthcare workforce shortages, burnout, and barriers to care for patients. As members of Congress, we must work together to create a healthcare system that is sustainable fair and always puts the patient first. It is important to not only support advancements that improve patient quality of care and strengthen the workforce, but also ensure that we are addressing barriers to care that affect underserved communities, communities that need the care the most due to the disparities of health and the burden of those disparities on those communities. As the witnesses here today have underscored, innovation in AI has the potential to address these concerns and improve patient care. However, these technologies also pose potential risks that we must carefully consider and mitigate as the technology continues to develop. As an emergency medicine physician, I am all too familiar with the administrative burden that physicians face and the negative impact that can have on patient care. Dr. Schlosser, how is AI currently helping physicians cut down on administrative burdens so they can focus their efforts on patient care, and how does this affect the quality of patient care? Thank you for the question, Mr. Ruiz, and uh, I agree completely with your comments uh, about the uh, burnout and administrative burden that our clinicians are seeing. As I just mentioned and mentioned in my testimony, uh, we focused in two areas. One is around documentation improvement. Uh, documentation takes up an uh, inordinate amount of our clinicians' time, and if we can return that time to them so they can focus on patients, on underserved patient populations, we believe we can actually create an expanded healthcare workforce using just the clinicians we already have by simply automating and removing some of those tasks. We're also looking at AI as an assistant to our nurses. Our nurses are under the 
same kind of pressure our physicians are uh, from shortage and burnout. And so giving them tools that helps them do their job, like the nurse handoff tool we talked about in the testimony, where we can automate a piece of their workflow, making it easier for them to spend time at the bedside with patients. We think both of those will lead to uh, improved experience and bring some of the joy back into caring for patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, your testimony mentioned specifically how Transparent uses generative AI in your virtual clinic. Uh, what safety mechanisms are in place to protect patient safety when using generative AI in health settings? Absolutely, yes. Uh, to clarify, uh, generative AI is still being prototyped internally at Transparent. We do use non-generative AI in our clinic. Um, safety mechanisms, though, uh, to consider when you are building generative AI or any AI uh, applications uh, really involve safety at every layer, right? So when you are building these systems, uh, you need to think about the data layer first, right, and ensure that you don't have a garbage in, garbage out system uh, problem in your system. Um, you also need redundant safety mechanisms. Um, I mentioned earlier the use of narrow versus general uh, AI systems. Um, you want to build redundant safety mechanisms that can detect things like patients asking questions that indicate they might have an emer a medical emergency, right? And you want those specialized systems in place um, ensuring, right, that you have a high degree of likelihood that you're going to catch uh, issues like that. Um, and so, you know, you want those redundant layers in order to ensure the highest level of patient safety. Uh, Dr. Newman Talker, what would be the ramifications of AI biases in health care if it is not addressed at this point in AI development? And what strategies should we be imp should be implemented to detect and mitigate biases in AI models used for health care? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Congressman. Um, what I would say is that obviously we don't want to concretize the racial biases that we see in, in, and other demographic biases that we see in, in human behavior today in the form of mathematical algorithms. To prevent that, we need to do work both on the, the side of developing the AI tools using appropriate data sets. We also need to deal with, at the back end, monitoring for these kinds of problems, both using sophisticated tools to identify bias, as has been done uh, in a number of recent studies, and furthermore, to monitor for outcomes of healthcare associated with AI so that we can monitor for measures that matter for patients who are underserved. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you all for your insight into the benefits and potential risks of using AI in healthcare. This insight is especially important to ensuring this innovative technology is used to improve patient care, improve access to care, reduce healthcare disparities, reduce uh, the, uh, the barriers in underserved communities, and improve equity uh, by giving uh, resources and healthcare attention to locations that need them the most, while mitigating biases and potential risk to patients. And I, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back, and I recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Longhurst, I'm going to pick on you first because I loved this book, The Perfect Predator, which was written by one of your colleagues. And so my question is, uh, and, and for those who don't know, it's about phage therapy and the, and the saving of her husband's life, uh, Thomas Patterson, uh, who also uh, is, a, is a UC uh, San Diego uh, individual. Uh, by finding the right virus to attack the antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria that had attacked his body. It's a great story if anybody wants to read it. The question is, are you all using AI to try to find more of those phage uh, therapy-type viruses? And if not, do you see any potential in that? Great question, and thank you for referring to the, the book, The Perfect Predator. It's an amazing story of a life saved by uh, phage therapy. Something that was actually uh, explored um, prior to the advent of antibiotics, and now we've gone back with uh, antibiotic resistance to looking for solutions outside of that domain. And so it started a whole uh, uh, movement across the world. We do have a center at UC San Diego pursuing expansion of phage therapy for uh, treatment of serious bacterial infections. Uh, I am not aware that we're currently using AI to help with that center, but as uh, previously mentioned, I think in general, drug discovery will be augmented by the use of uh, AI, and I'm very optimistic that we're going to see uh, large language model uh, generated hypotheses about new ways of treating patients 
that we may not have previously examined uh, hypothetically. So thank you. And that was a little bit off script. I'm going to go back to script, but it's the, the I'm going to flip the coin over on the other side. According to re, uh, reporting, the use of artificial intelligence has the potential to allow for generative large language models like chat GPT and other chat bots to revive uh, old deadly pathogens. So we talked about how it can help. It can also be used to revive old deadly pathogens or even create new deadlier ones. One example was done at MIT where students were able to get the large language models to suggest four potential pandemic pathogens within one hour by asking a series of questions to a generative large language model. Further, researchers in Cambridge, Massachusetts used open source language excuse me, so open source large language model asking it how to revive the 1918 Spanish flu. Several participants found obtaining the 1918 virus Spanish flu would be feasible for someone with basic wet lab skills, while one participant got very close, in quote, in quote, very close to learning all the steps needed to obtain the virus. So I'm going to go to you, Dr. Wynn. I was encouraged to see the White House put out an executive order to attempt to provide more oversight and security on this type of AI, but this still causes grave concern. Do you know if any AI technologies have security limits on what can be asked and what cannot be asked? Thank you, Congressman. That's a very good question. Um, in a broader sense, even outside of healthcare, right, these AI technologies have extremely broad uh, and wide capabilities, many of which we, we don't fully understand yet. Um, while this is outside the realm of the kind of AI Transcarent uses, uh, AI in general, especially generative AI in the large language model sense, um, there in that field there is the world of alignment research, right? Uh, the world of alignment research uh, refers to the science of studying the malicious capabilities of these models um, and studying the ways in which we can defend against them. Um, so in that world, right, uh, it, it, very, very important work is being done uh, to find things such as what you are describing, right, which is vectors of malicious use. Um, there is still a lot of work to be done in that world, uh, and I think it is very important for us uh, in the healthcare world to follow that, acknowledge it, um, for this committee to support that kind of work. So we want to look on the positive side, but one of the articles I was reading indicated that the proponent said maybe we need a some kind of a test ban treaty like we do with nuclear weapons. Do you think that we should be looking at some kind of a limitation on the tests? I mean, we want the positives, but the negatives could also be very consequential. Yeah, that's a very good question as well. I think it's very difficult uh, to truly limit the progress, you know, of testing these systems and making them safe without using them, uh, right? And and trying to push them to their limits, right? So I think it uh, requires a measured approach. Um, the other risk, though, of course, of, of uh, test banning is that uh, countries other than the United States will also write uh, right. progress. Right. Right. I'm going to switch gears again. Back to you, Dr. Longhurst. You mentioned in your testimony the AI-based messaging system was helpful for virtual care visits and allowing doctors to provide more care to patients. The question is, did the patients trust the system and find benefit from those automated responses? Thank you for your question. I know we're expired on time. I will say briefly that anecdotally we've gotten very positive feedback from patients and we're uh, submitting uh, more quantitative data for publication. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back and I recognize General A from Michigan, Ms. Dingle, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're living in an increasingly technological world and the emergence of new technologies like AI has the ability to reshape or shape the way, as you all have been talking about, address public health and improve patient outcomes. But, and as we keep talking about, and I've got many concerns like others have expressed here, on the other hand, AI does pose serious risks that left unchecked can harm patients and quite frankly, our national security. But as this subcommittee has discussed, the COVID-19 pandemics taught us a lot about the fragility of our healthcare supply chains and how vulnerable they are to disruptions. It's really a national security issue, and we've learned that during COVID. How can we keep our nation safe if we can't access the medicines, the devices, and protective equipment we need to protect communities from public threats? Earlier this month, I joined a panel for a discussion on healthcare supply chains and what we think these supply chains will look like in the future. In addition to identifying ways to reduce our reliance on overseas manufacturers and bring these supply chains home, 
We all agreed we need to find ways to strengthen our existing supply chains, improve transparency, and increase efficiency. Mr. Shen, I think uh, AI has a role to play in all of this. How does AI support healthcare supply chain management? Yeah, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think for artificial intelligence here, artificial intelligence has the ability to, to be able to drive efficiencies as it relates to the supply chain here. So being able to leverage computing power to be able to simplify some of the processes that today are dependent on other, other components, maybe some of those that are outside the US here, but being able to leverage artificial intelligence to be able to accelerate the ability to, to drive uh, delivery and efficiency of, of supplies that are needed. We see this directly within, within the solutions that we make here at Siemens uh, Health and Ears that we try to leverage to computing power here to, to be less reliant on certain components that might not be accessible here. And we, we saw the success of that during the pandemic itself by being able to deliver still diagnostic equipment and therapeutic technologies to patients and providers during that time. Drug shortages, thank you for that, are a persisting challenge that threaten patients' health and well-being. This summer was really, we saw very real shortages. We're still seeing them now. I don't know why I say this summer. We continue to see shortages of critical cancer drugs like cisplatin and carboplatin. But during last year's flu and RSV season, parents across the country had difficulty finding common over the counter pain relievers such as Tylenol and Advil for their kids, as well as antibiotic am amoxicillin, which is used to treat common infections. Mr. Shen, how are suppliers already using AI to address these drug shortages? Yeah, again, thanks, thanks for the question again. Uh, and it's real, I'm serious. Yes, yes, it is. It is a challenge. But, it, but it, I think that's what's the exciting part about artificial intelligence and its ability here to be able to drive efficiencies within, within the processes that are established. Within Siemens Health and Ears, we leverage artificial intelligence both not only to provide solutions to take care of patients, but we also use that to improve the processes that we have internally within our organization. That allows us to be able to deliver diagnostic and therapeutic imaging solutions to our to providers, to physicians in a timely fashion, and making sure that patients receive the, the latest technology available, uh, uh, medical technology available to help them with their diagnosis. Thank you. We gotta keep working on it though. Um, during the pandemic, we also saw a tremendous need to ensure limited resources were strategically going to the communities and patients that needed them the most. Dr. Newman Toker, how can AI help us determine how to best allocate our resources? Um, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Obviously, we've, we've uh, heard a little bit from uh, Mr. Shen about the architecture of AI allowing us to improve the allocation of resources. I think one of the critical issues in this space is about having the right data architectures to be able to get to the point where AI can actually help us in those ways. So often the, the key problem is that we don't have the right kinds of information about where the shortages exist and how and, and, uh, and, and where the, the mismatch is between supply and demand. So I think that's one of the critical pieces of the puzzle. If we want AI to work properly, we're going to have to um, create data sets that, that are digestible by AI for real-time use. I'm out of time, so Mr. Chairman, I have more questions for the record and ask, thank the witnesses for being here. General Lee yields back. And I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, five minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Shen, can you tell us about the role of generative AI, what it is, and what its potential can be within the healthcare sector? I know it's a general question, but uh, and I, I know others have uh, uh, asked this question, but it's so very important. Please. No, I appreciate that, Congressman. Yeah. So certainly my, my colleagues have also talked about generative AI, so perhaps maybe I'll talk about it as it relates to medical imaging and where we see the impact Sounds of good. for patients. So with, with generative AI here, where we see the greatest potential is the ability for the AI to consume more, more information about the patient themselves. So when a patient actually goes to get an exam done to get, to, to, to get a diagnosis, for example, Leveraging generative AI gives them the ability to know exactly what, what precise 
what precise the diagnosis should we be, should we be looking for? Yeah, so not just doing a test just for the sake of doing a test on that patient, but actually doing a test because we're seeking a particular diagnosis that's happening there. So that actually, if you think about it, uh, helps the patient not go through, uh, avoid going through multiple exams, just trying to look for what the issue is here. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's potentially one area. The other area where generative AI has some, some benefit from a medical imaging standpoint is actually the interpretation of the images themselves. So the ability to be able to take all this, this complicated medical language and, con and convey the, the diagnosis to layman's terms for the patient themselves. So the patient gets a better understanding of what, what's going on in the test results that they've had from that exam. Oh, that's great stuff. We appreciate it, very exciting. Uh, Mr. Shen, uh, I appreciate the, that your testimony mentions the use of predetermined change control plans. Uh, and I was proud to lead the, the effort in the House uh, last Congress to authorize the use of the PCCPs through my bill uh, that got enacted into law last year. Can you describe the PCCP pathway and explain to us how this can allow for a more efficient regulatory framework and why it's so important to ensure that FDA implements this bill effectively. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Congressman, and again, thank you very much for the for the PCC effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so enactment of the uh, of the predetermined change control pr plan allows organizations like Siemens Health Nears to include in our initial FDA product application a description of how the software will be updated rapidly based on new data as it comes about. So without the need to have to resubmit back to the FDA any sort of application or supplement every single time an update happens. So this really helps ex accelerate and, and go in conjunction with all the rapid development around a technology like artificial intelligence. The PCC itself, we have to include a description of the modifications, the methodology that we're using, so we provide that transparency that's needed that we've talked about here today as it relates to that technology here. And again, we're very, very pleased that the, with your help there that we were able to, that we're able to move forward and make sure that PCC, uh, PCCP is part of, part of the FDA process going forward. Thank you, excellent. Uh, one question for Dr. Schlosser. Can you elaborate on the potential that large language models have in reducing provider burden within the hospital settings, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Congressman. So as I've mentioned in my testimony, I think there are numerous opportunities where our current healthcare system has created what we refer to as administrative burden, added tasks to physicians, nurses, pharmacists, other healthcare providers that don't directly add value to the patient, where they're acting as data entry analysts or uh, transferring information between uh, different providers or different systems. And large language models are actually really good at those types of tasks. If we can train them to understand the data, which is part of the challenge, uh, they can search for information, read complex medical charts, find information from multiple disparate sources, synthesize and understand it, and then serve it up to the healthcare providers in their workflow. And then because they're language models, you can actually interact with them in a natural language way. You can ask questions and get feedback. And so it's a really powerful tool to make the universe of healthcare information around a patient simple and easy to access. Very good. Good stuff. Uh, I'll yield back the rest of my time, Mr. Turner. Gentlemen, Appreciate yield it. back. Now recognize gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, five minutes. Thank you, Chair Guthrie and Ranking Member Eshoo for holding today's critically important hearing. The integration of AI in the healthcare system offers the potential to be a transformative solution to address long-term disparities and access issues. Many in both the healthcare and technology fields have promoted AI as a means to create a more accessible and equitable healthcare landscape, particularly in minority, underserved, and rural communities. Dr. Newman Toker, I'm hopeful about the potential synergy of AI's ability to improve clinical trial diversity by scanning multiple databases for clinical site placement and patient populations with the hopes that diverse patient populations can be matched with clinical trials, thus resulting in a more efficient and diverse recruitment process. What incentives or regulations need to be considered regarding AI's use to improve clinical trial diversity? Uh, thank you for the excellent question, Congresswoman. Um, clearly, diversity in clinical trials is, is a, an essential component of eliminating health disparities. We've seen that 
a, a large number of treatments that we have studied over the course of time have only been studied in white men or, 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 or uh, very restricted uh, populations with minorities. And I do think that the potential of AI to identify locations and places where patients can be recruited is, is a strong one. Um, in, in terms of the regulatory framework, I do think that some of the, the uh, existing architectures around uh, clinical trial requirements for diversity are, I think are important. I think we're going to have to make sure that we um, further bolster that as we get deeper into the AI space in order to make sure that um, we're having overrepresented groups of minorities so that, that, that we can do proper subgroup analyses across demographic groups. Thank you. Additionally, this body has worked in a bipartisan manner to decrease the length of time for prior authorization to Medicare populations. While I'm supportive of the use of AI to improve the timeliness of prior authorizations, I'm concerned about multiple recent articles on the use of AI in prior authorizations and the association with high rates of claim denials. So again, Dr. Newman Toker, the reliance on AI for crucial medical decisions introduces the risk of patient harm. Rigorous testing and validation are imperative to ensure the safety and efficacy of these technologies, preventing errors or mis misinterpretations that could have severe consequences for patient well-being. In your review of these AI systems embedded in prior authorizations, can you explain why we are currently seeing such disappointing outcomes and what can we do to help mitigate these troublesome findings? And thank you for the excellent question, Congresswoman. I do think part of the problem here is that uh, this is uh, th there's a, a pre-existing arms race in the the space around claims, with uh, I insurers generally trying to to find ways to reduce their expenditures and deny more claims, and providers trying to increase their claims and the 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 revenue that's generated associated with this. And now we're seeing that escalate into the AI space. I think. When we think more broadly about the issue of regulation here, um, what we've been talking a little bit about AI used in the context of healthcare with patients. I think what you're alluding to is all of the AI that may exist out in the periphery around the problem, and that's a totally unregulated space, and that's a potentially uh, dangerous area because we have no idea even what systems are being used for uh, controlling the process of healthcare or access to healthcare, or even direct to patients in the form of symptom checkers and otherwise. All of these things exist outside of our regulatory frameworks, and I do think we need to start bringing some of those into the regulatory framework. Thank you. Dr. Longhurst, I have to give you a chance to comment because you're shaking your head. <laughs> Well, your uh, questions, I think, are incredibly pertinent, and uh, not only do we need to think about the diversity of clinical trial participants and uh, ensuring equity and how this is uh, impacting the healthcare system and, and care of patients, we also need to think about our workforce and uh, ensuring that we're creating diversity in the AI workforce. Previous comments suggested we need to um, train our uh, medical students and other young professionals in uh, these new technologies. And I think that's absolutely correct. And I think we're at risk of making these technologies only available to those who can afford them. And so I want to use this opportunity to express my strong support for the bipartisan proposed legislation, Create AI, Creating Resources for Every American, to experiment with Artificial Intelligence Act of 2023, which would establish the National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource, or NAIR. Both UC San Diego and the University of California Office of the President strongly endorse this Create AI proposal uh, because it would provide the opportunity for academic researchers uh, to develop better methods and knowledge on these systems, but it's not just for academics, right? It's for small businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations. So uh, thank you for that proposal. Legislation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank Generally, you. use back. Now, I recognize Mr. Johnson from Ohio. Five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our panelists for being here today. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence or AI is creating uh, quite a buzz around Capitol Hill. That's to say the least. Even across the country, it's been met with both excitement and concern. Whether the American people realize it or not. AI is already prevalent in many sectors, particularly in the healthcare space. I have always been an advocate for innovation and development of new technologies, and AI is no different in this regard. I worked uh, with AI when AI literally was just a buzzword back in the uh, uh, back in the early 80s when I was in graduate school at Georgia Tech. So I'm very familiar with the technology, but simply put. 
AI is a tool that our medical professionals and scientists can use to not only further the development of care and therapeutics, resulting in better outcomes for patients, but hopefully lower cost to families and the taxpayer. Unlike the vast majority of Congress, I, uh, as I mentioned, I actually have a tech background, uh, and in my time in the military, as well as the time spent in the private sector, I worked in information technology, and I understand the benefits and challenges of AI. Uh, it's been around for decades. Take electronic health records, for example. As Congress continues to incentivize adoption, and rightfully so, we're, sad, uh, we're saddling health care systems with an immense amount of data. From patient notes to imaging, doctors and nurses are expected to utilize all this information to best treat their patients. That's a lot easier said than done. It's a lot of information. This is a perfect example of how AI can be utilized in reading and deciphering all this data. They can make these health records more digestible and ultimately increase outcomes for everyone, not to mention lessening the administrative burden for physicians, nurses, and healthcare systems nationwide. Generative AI has gotten a lot of attention as a result of chat GPT and Claude and other public facing technologies that have been widely used over the last year. However, uh, generative AI has been used in healthcare for years through patient engagement technologies and clinical decision support models. So my first question, uh, uh, Dr. Schlosser, Schlosser, do I have that right? Am I saying that right? That's right. Thank you. What are some of the other promising ways you see generative AI integrating into the healthcare system? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Johnson. And there's, there's numerous opportunities. I think the one you highlighted around making the vast universe of data that clinicians and physicians have to access uh, more easy to access is a one we're incredibly excited about. We're working right now with one of our partners on what's essentially an AI assistant in your pocket uh, so that you can interact with the electronic health record as well as the entire information health exchange uh, through a natural language interface, allowing you to search for and look for information that otherwise it would take a long time and, and it's very burdensome. Um, if you ever have seen a CCD, which is a, the output of the HIE, is this giant list of data that uh, is the way that information is provided, it's incredibly difficult to use. But these models actually are capable of doing more than just read and understand information. We've, we've taught a model to look at our staffing schedules across an entire hospital um, and are able to ask it questions like, how do we better balance Friday nights? And so we can deploy our labor workforce in a much more efficient and effective way by harvesting the intelligence uh, contained within these large uh, deep learning models to solve complex problems that previously were put on nurse leaders or mm -hmm. others um, that, that just struggle to have the information and, and to deliver the outcomes we're looking for. Let me, let, me, let me get to a second question. What about rural and underserved populations like Eastern Ohio and Appalachia, where I, where I live? What, what can Congress do to facilitate more adoption of these technologies across smaller and rural practices to make our healthcare system more personalized and ensure every patient provider has access to the highest quality healthcare technology? Yeah, that's another great question. And so we learned through the pandemic that there's basically a one-to-one -one relationship between having enough healthcare providers and the patients that you need to take care of, that the ultimately providers deliver care. And so the way we see AI helping solve this problem is by literally freeing them up from tasks that are not focused on caring for those populations so that we can, in a sense, increase the size of our healthcare workforce without actually needing more bodies, but just through AI. Yeah. Can, uh, one final question before my time expires here. Can you, and you can answer this for the record if you would get back to me because my time has expired. Um, how can we facilitate, what can Congress do to facilitate more private investment into these technologies to, uh, to make them more useful to the healthcare system. Yeah, thanks if you for the would, question. If you would get back to me, I'd appreciate it. I will. I yield back, Mr. The gentleman yields back. And I now recognize the gentleman from Washington, Dr. Schreier, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all of our witnesses today for this interesting conversation. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are already transforming how, uh, how we study and practice medicine. And, as we continue to grow these capabilities and to make further breakthroughs, it's really important that Congress keeps up, and I thank you for this uh, education. 
Uh, last spring, Mr. Shen, I loved visiting Siemens Ultrasound Research and Development uh, Center headquarters located in my hometown of Issaquah, Washington. And during my visit, I, uh, I learned about and got to see um, pretty incredible uh, innovations being done. One of them was the ability to diagnose non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in uh, an ultrasound scan that took less than a minute and to be able to catch this early. And the implications for morbidity, mortality are incredible. Um, but you know, every time we have a new uh, advance, there's this question of cost. And as we integrate artificial intelligence and these more advanced algorithms and new technology, um, there are impacts on costs. There's de development impacts, um, but there's also potential cost savings down the line if you're avoiding liver transplants. I was wondering if you could, I have two questions, so just kind of partition your time, um, kind of comment a little bit on AI development and cost. Yep. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. And of course, we were very happy to host you at our, at our Issaquah facility. Um, as it relates to artificial intelligence, I, I, as, as you correctly noted, we're trying to integrate AI tools directly into the types of exams or devices that are, that are touching patients here. So here, in this case, for ultrasound, being able to integrate the AI and not have it as be a separate type of solution there. So doing that in itself reduces some of the costs. So rather than having trying to have a separate AI solution that has to be maintained, has to be procured or whatnot, we actually integrate those solutions directly into the medical devices that are treating the patient. So that's that's one aspect of it. And then as we looked at AI overall, we, we do want to look at not just the, the cost of procuring that AI, but what is that downstream cost? What is that, what is that benefit, not just to the patient in terms of maybe you know, fewer days that they have to spend at the hospital or, or maybe shorter time to diagnosis or to treatment, but also cost savings that could be could be realized by the provider themselves as well. So that, that the provider, by deploying this type of technology, is able to be more efficient, is able to be able to make that diagnosis faster, is able to see more patients because they now have more time to be able to take care of one patient and move quickly to the next patient. So these are all things that we think about as we develop AI algorithms. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my next question, I want to talk to, uh, or pivot to Dr. Longhurst, and this is really about um, the impact of AI on the physician-patient experience. Ranking member Eshu talked about the patient experience. I'd like to talk about, talk about a little bit about the, the doctor experience. And I can understand how nice it would be to have the latest uh, research pop up as a, um, a suggested pathway for a given patient who I'm seeing, um, who's maybe already filled out their whole uh, history uh, for me. Um, but I, doctors are already burnt out. Um, we are, we've been compared in an op-ed to cogs in a wheel, to line workers after almost a decade of training post-university, uh, and we're being asked to see more patients faster, do more things in a visit, and people, they're, we're burning out. And so I wanted to talk with you about kind of the, the physician-patient relationship, the trust that's there, how physicians feel when, you know, perhaps they're just becoming a check on a system where, where AI makes patient management decisions for them after that kind of training. Can you speak about that? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schreier. And it's a real privilege to speak with a fellow uh, pediatric graduate from Stanford. Um, when I was at uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, we were in the process of implementing the electronic health record. And as we all know, the electronic health record, if not the primary cause, has become a, a primary symptom of burnout. The many hours that our uh, pediatricians, physicians in general spend documenting the electronic health record is uh, contributing to a national epidemic of what we call pajama time or after hours work. We know that for every day spent in clinic, the average physician spends about two hours documenting electronic health record to ensure regulatory compliance, billing, and other things. And so where the electronic health record was a really important digital infrastructure for collecting data for quality and population purposes, it's introduced these unintended consequences. I'm incredibly optimistic about AI, particularly the AI scribes that Dr. Schlosser described as being a solution to help decrease the burden that was introduced by electronic health records. So we're seeing just incredibly positive results from pilots uh, using these scribes. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the technologies are still quite expensive, but as they become commoditized and uh, continue to demonstrate outcomes and privacy, 
I, I think this is going to help us to uh, remediate some of the burnout that uh, has happened over the last decade. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I yield back. Generally, I yield back. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, while I'm only just beginning to learn about how AI can contribute to healthcare, I recognize it has great potential. I was a cardiothoracic surgeon before I was in Congress. And I do believe that ultimately technology used properly will help us control cost. I really believe that. Uh, as an example, a top priority of mine is legislation that would allow real-time prior authorization decisions by Medicare Advantage plans and ultimately by all health plans. Um, I recognize that AI would make real-time decision-making far more feasible and expect that it would be used for this purpose. At the same time, we're hearing allegations that health plans are making coverage determinations using AI-powered tools that are ultimately shown to have high rates of errors, as was mentioned by Ms. Eshoo, the ranking member, in her opening statement, resulting in patients paying more for health care or perhaps foregoing necessary medical interventions. Basically, these are improperly denied claims. Recent media articles have outlined this situation, which is unacceptable, and I would argue that this should be investigated by Congress. I say all of this to remind my colleagues that our approach needs to be balanced and to remind the companies using AI to do so responsibly. Uh, just a statement, Mr. Schlosser, as long as the AI can properly populate the record to obtain appropriate reimbursement for the providers involved in the case, you'll see wide acceptance of it if there are, if, even if their record is uh, there. Uh, but it doesn't properly reimburse the provider for their care, then it'll be a struggle, and I'm assuming it will probably do that. Um, that's a major issue for providers, the documentation that is required by the federal government for reimbursement, uh, honestly, in my view, has been a problem for a long time. Another, another issue in our healthcare system uh, will, uh, we will need to think about is using more AI in how we train and educate medical professionals to use it appropriately. Uh, I'm going to address this to Dr. Wynn. Your testimony mentioned using AI to train and educate medical professionals. Um, there may be a risk uh, that our future providers will become overly dependent on technology resulting in less well-trained providers in the art of clinical decision making. I'll give you an example of Google Maps. It's not direct, but any, I have uh, adult children who are in their 20s, I mean, they can't navigate anywhere without Google Maps. I mean, they literally don't know what direction they're going. Uh, and uh, to go around the block, they map it. That, I would call that an over-reliance on technology. It's not a direct correlation, but kind of. So how do we begin to train these professionals on the uses of AI and increase the awareness of the pros and cons um, and, and is that something that medical schools are beginning to think about? And if not, should we be? Thank you, Dr. Bouchon. Uh, that's a very uh, prescient example. Uh, I, too, have a lot of trouble navigating without Google Maps, so I fully understand that. Um, I, I think that, you know, our institutions uh, very rightfully so focus on the art uh, and science of, of medicine, right? Um, at the same time, I think it is very, very important that institutions leverage these new AI technologies to create learning experiences, first to enhance the learning experiences uh, and make them more efficient, uh, enabling students to really hone in on uh, the most important concepts that they need to know uh, in, the, in, in an efficient amount of time. Um, second, I think it's very, very important that these institutions train and educate their students on the nuances of these technologies it will be unavoidable that doctors of the future use these technologies whether or not they are trained in them. Uh, and so the most important way to prevent over-reliance is to educate them on the limitations of that technology. I, I, would, I would agree with that. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big supporter of technology and innovation in the healthcare space. I guess, Mr. Shen, you can talk about maybe, you know, real time. What's, uh, are, are we seeing medical professionals real time over-relying on AI as it relates to the evaluation of, for example, uh, CT scans, MRIs, X-rays, is there are the people coming up uh, being properly uh, uh, trained? I would say, I guess, on the positives and negatives uh, of this situation. I mean, that's going to be really important, right? Yeah, no, this is a great question, uh, Vice Chair Bouchon. I, 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 
I think as to echo what Dr. Nguyen was talking about, I, what's critical here is transparency around the artificial intelligence, not, not in terms of how you actually use the AI, but how, again, how is the AI making that clinical determination and educating these upcoming physicians on what, how, how the AI is actually making that clinical determination? Thank you both for the answer to that question. It's really important. Uh, now, uh, I recognize Ms. Custer from New Hampshire, five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of you for sticking with us. We appreciate it. Today's hearing is an opportunity to understand how artificial intelligence can help patients, providers, and researchers. To fully realize this potential, we need to ensure that AI tools are safe and equitable. I want to use this hearing to discuss one opportunity and two concerns I have with AI health. For the opportunity, I'll look to Dr. Newman Toker. In your testimony, you describe one potential benefit to AI is that it can improve patient outcomes through more accurate diagnoses. Could you give us some examples of how AI tools could benefit public health? Uh, yes, so uh, as, uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman, for the excellent question. As I noted in my testimony, uh, we've recently estimated that about 800,000 Americans die or are permanently disabled each year from diagnostic error with serious medical illnesses like stroke, heart attack, pneumonia, sepsis, et cetera. There's an enormous potential public health impact of being able to uh, close that gap, that quality gap, with AI-based detection of uh, using laboratory data and vital signs for things like sepsis, uh, using video-based interpretation of uh, eye movements for stroke diagnosis is some of the work that we've been doing. So I think there's tremendous potential in that space. And at the same time, to deal with some of the concerns raised earlier about costs, because when you realign, uh, when, when you actually improve diagnosis, what you do is you cut down on both false positives and false negatives at the same time. And by doing that, you save lives by catching the cases you had missed, and you cut costs by not over-investigating the patients that didn't need that investigation. So I think it's a tremendous public health opportunity. Good. Thank you. Um, two concerns. I'm worried about bias in the data. Um, continuing with Dr. Newman Toker, you also state in your testimony for AI tools to be maximally beneficial, they must be properly validated and utilize gold standard data sets. Um, what steps can companies and researchers take to ensure that the data that's being used to train AI systems is accurate and without bias? Um, Thank you for the wonderful question. I, I do believe that this is the foundational challenge that, that, that faces the, this whole area of AI in healthcare. The issue of creating gold standard data sets is not a, there's not a simple solution to that problem. We actually have to uh, do things in healthcare that we don't normally do, such as, for example, determine what actually happens to our patients downstream after an encounter. So we say, for example, that a patient leaves our care and they have X diagnosis, but we don't actually know if that's true. We often don't get that follow-up. They may go somewhere else. They may end up in a different health system. So we have to start coordinating data architectures, and we have to start developing and curating good data sets that can be used at a large scale to train these AI models. So I do think that that's going to take a, a big effort and one that would be best coordinated federally. Helpful, thank you. And my final concern is about protecting patient data when we are developing AI tools. Um, Dr. Shen, I appreciate Siemens Health and Ears commitment to protecting patient data. Unfortunately, we've seen an increase in healthcare cyber attacks, which have more than doubled from 2016 to 2021. What steps does your team take to ensure patient data being used to train AI tools is protected from cyber criminals and just plain bad actors? Yes, very, very, very timely question. I really appreciate that, Congresswoman. So, here at Siemens Health and Ears, we take data privacy and patient data privacy as 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 a core core component to how we approach the development of artificial intelligence. And to that respects, as it re as it relates to securing the data, one of the important aspects that we do is that any of the data that we utilize to train our AI algorithms is is f fully protected in in our big data office that's there in Princeton, New Jersey. So there are physical limitations that are set already in place, that the physical barriers that don't allow individuals or bad actors to gain access to that, to that data center there. And then from a cyber standpoint, what our uh, big data office does is that they actually control 
who has access to the data itself and, uh, and in terms of controlling internally the audit that's needed for, in, in terms of who are the users that can access that clinical data to do the algorithm training. So they have the ability to audit the user access and restrict the user access to the, only the individuals who need to be uh, accessing that data. Great, thank you. Um, I'm all set, I'll yield back. The general lady yields back and the chair recognized Dr. Dunn for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate all the insights from our witnesses regarding the role of AI in the clinical setting. Uh, I believe there's an important debate to be had about the value add versus the risks of AI in the doctor's office and the hospital. And I agree with our witnesses uh, about the promises of this technology in medicine. I also echo Dr. Nguyen's caution and careful consideration when AI is utilized for clinical decision making without close physician oversight. It's clear from the advances in AI, from narrow AI to the generative and large language models, that there are sweeping implications for the delivery of healthcare, and it presents clear opportunities and challenges. Uh, I'm encouraged by the efforts to explore the role of AI in interpreting radiology and pathology. Uh, and although I think the current evidence uh, demonstrates that this, this is not quite ready for prime time, I'm certain that that will become more sophisticated over time. I am especially optimistic about the ability of AI platforms to reduce administrative burdens and simplify clerical tasks. I appreciate the questions that Dr. Schreier asked him on, on that uh, in that queue, and that's that's a real problem. Is we all address burnout. Uh, physicians are spending a quarter of their time or more on on administrative tasks. So uh, that that's a that's a huge. I, I would have loved to have had that when I was practicing. You know, quite honestly, I do have some concern that the private practices may struggle with the upfront cost of adopting AI technology, and I, I urge the industry to think creatively about ways to provide access to that technology to the full spectrum of provider settings. And uh, to echo uh, Mr. Johnson's uh, concerns with our rural communities, rural providers who will be further disadvantaged if they don't have access to that. Uh, if, if those technologies are only accessible to those with the resources, we may have an even worse shortage in uh, rural medicine. So Dr. Nguyen, can you briefly comment on any specific challenges uh, that rural or private practices may face when trying to adopt something like transparent? Uh, so, yes, yes, Congressman. So to address your question, I think there are always going to be challenges with the rural and private practices, who, which are just simply smaller in size, smaller in staff, smaller in budget, right? Uh, the challenges come in many ways, shapes, and forms for any technology adoption, AI included, and that is the capacity to assess, right, the right tools to adopt and the budget to adopt them. Um, I think it's very, very important, right, to continue to support the development of uh, AI tools uh, amongst the private industry uh, in a safe and non-biased way because that is actually, uh, in my opinion, the fastest way that ultimately a lot of these practices will experience uh, and be able to use these generative AI tools is when the vendors and the tools that they use begin to incorporate those, um, right? Uh, when we began adopting EHRs, right, most of these pri private practices um, had access to EHRs once vendors began to build it for those practices specifically. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to have, do offline out of this hearing, have somebody from your company come tell me what's your pricing mechanism, you know, for different practices and, and how they how they can uh, you know, adopt that in their office. So that'd be something we could do separately. Dr. Schlosser, briefly, what are some of the ways you've seen AI improve efficiencies for patients, improve their experience? Well, one thing that uh, all the clinicians and probably everyone in the room will acknowledge is that we ask patients the same questions over and over again. Um, we're constantly uh, burdening them with delivering their entire health history at each interaction uh, along a healthcare journey. And then if you change systems or go to a different physician, you start that entire process over. So I think the ability of AI to help us wrangle this entire universe of healthcare data that exists across multiple disparate EHRs into a longitudinal record of the patient that clinicians and patients can easily access. Just access, you're right. So I spent more time as a patient than a doctor in the last few years up here in Congress, and I have to tell you, I filled out my history probably a thousand times. <laughs> 
Yep. It's, it's just an amazing experience to be. Dr. Longhorst, your testimony, uh, you made reference to a study, I believe you were co-author on that study, actually, in which an algorithm was rapidly deployed to analyze chest X-rays in COVID-19 patients. Uh, every clinician I know has been reading uh, chest X-rays for 40 years. What, what specific advantages did uh, you confer to these, uh, these physicians? Yeah, great question. Thank you. I can tell you the day that we rolled this algorithm out that I uh, walked through the emergency department and asked uh, if our attending physicians had used it. And one of them said, yeah, last night we got a chest x-ray on this uh, uh, woman who was in for cardiac symptoms. We didn't see a sign of pneumonia. The radiologist didn't call any pneumonia, but the AI showed some color, and because of that, we ordered a test. I said, well, what did the test show? And the answer was, well, it takes 24 hours to come back. It <laughs> turns out that test was positive. That patient was diagnosed with COVID early before symptoms. Patient was proactively hospitalized, did not need critical care, went home safely. And to me, that was a really great example of the AI finding a signal that we would not have found otherwise as a human. And that's the kind of promise I think the technology holds when deployed appropriately. Thank you, Dr. Longhurst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your forbearance. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Ms. the gentlelady from Massachusetts, Ms. Trahan, for five minutes for questions. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this hearing uh, and to all the witnesses here today. Uh, AI in healthcare has the potential to transform various aspects of the industry by offering new solutions, improving efficiency, and enhancing patient outcomes. However, Congress does have the responsibility to make sure that we establish appropriate guardrails around AI in healthcare in a way that works best for consumers and maintains patient and provider trust. According to a new Qualtrics survey of more than 28,000 consumers across the globe, consumers are more hesitant about using AI to get advice about medical problems than they are for other uses like billing and, and customer service. As the use of AI in medicine becomes more commonplace, patients have raised, uh, raised logical comments around privacy, transparency, ethical considerations, human oversight, errors and misdiagnoses, and access issues. With this in mind, I just welcome the opportunity to discuss some of those uh, issues today. Uh, many of my colleagues have already brought up valid ethical considerations around AI, including biases and algorithms, potential discrimination, and AI's impact on vulnerable populations. As AI advances into healthcare and begins to play a role in making medical decisions, I'm curious if there are differences among various patient demographics in their willingness to consent to AI uh, decision making and whether those preferences may unintentionally skew algorithms. Uh, so Dr. Newman Toker, I'm wondering how important is it to understand if there are patterns of patients who would or would not consent uh, to use of AI in healthcare based on race, education level, uh, ge geographic area, et cetera? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, that's a fabulous question. Uh, I think I don't have any specific data about the demographic variability in trust with respect to AI specifically, but we have seen over and over again that trust issues are un inequitably distributed. So, for example, in, in Baltimore, there's a, a strong strain of lack of trust of the healthcare system in the black community. <laughs> and this is a, a, a major problem for getting equitably distributed data from patients. So I do believe that you've pointed to a critical concern that uh, trust gaps are a, a major issue and they may not be evenly distributed. Thank you. Um, the, the rapid, I'm gonna switch gears, um, but we'll definitely probe that further as we, as we progress. Uh, the rapid evolution of AI in healthcare has exposed the need for federal coverage and, and payment policies that promote innovation and protect uh, patients' um, interests. While the FDA has moved forward to regulate software uh, as a medical device, CMS has yet to establish consistent methods for the coverage and payment of these technologies. Uh, Mr. Shen, what, are, are our federal agencies like the FDA and CMS well positioned to keep up with the rapid increase in innovative technologies such as software, algorithms, and AI? And if not, what additional capability or resources do those agencies need? Yeah, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think as you uh, correctly pointed out, you know, we work very closely with the FDA and CMS to try to bring forth these new and emerging technologies and make sure that they get into the hands of providers and the, the patients themselves. 
Where we're seeing the challenge here is unfortunately uh, specifically around CMS and the reimbursement associated with artificial intelligence. Today, unfortunately, it, there's inconsistency in, uh, in terms of how this technology is being reimbursed, and that inconsistency and uncertainty translates to providers being unsure whether they should make the investment in artificial intelligence, not knowing whether they will actually get reimbursement or not for this. So we see this as, as actually inhibiting and creating a bit of an adoption problem and, and uh, preventing uh, the patients from ultimately benefiting from this technology. So we would love to see opportunities where working with this committee here, uh, trying to figure out a better way to work with CMS to maybe establish some sort of uh, payment that allows, allows, and in, uh, allows the different providers to move forward with investing in artificial intelligence and helping everybody understand what the true value of, of this technology is. Right. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and while there is warranted skepticism around the use of AI in healthcare, you know, we're all excited uh, for increased applications of AI and how they will positively impact uh, patient outcomes. Dr. Longhurst, how are we already seeing AI used to enhance progress to treat diseases with no known cure like Alzheimer's and MS? Oh, <laughs> I looked up where to go. <laughs> Did, can anyone uh, else Dr. Longhurst had to <laughs> step away. I'll, I'll, as the neurologist on the panel, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll field that one. Um, I, I think there's tremendous potential for AI to do early detection of disease, uh, chronic disease in particular, such as Alzheimer's disease. You can imagine if we can make diagnoses uh, 10 years in advance through uh, information coming out of wearables or eye movement analysis, we will be able to then apply early pre preventative therapy. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Well, thank you, Dr. Newman Toker. Uh, appreciate, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. This is obviously a, a very hot subject on Capitol Hill artificial intelligence, and, and particularly in the healthcare world, we're very concerned about it. And uh, look, I'm a big believer in telehealth. I represent a rural area, and, and I've seen how it has benefited us in, in the rural areas. Um, I, as you know, all of you know that we've got a doctor shortage here in America, particularly in our rural areas. Telehealth has been in a a great savior for us. Um, I've always said that there's a big difference between knowing something and realizing something. And uh, during the pandemic, I think we realized just how important telehealth can be. Uh, I think there was an article in the paper in the New York Times that said that telehealth had advanced more in one day than it had in the last 10 years, and it probably has. So I want to kind of uh, kind of focus on telehealth here. Dr. Wynn, can you talk about how Transcurrent is uh, using AI within your telehealth solution and how that's allowing your doctors to be more efficient with their time so that they can see more patients? Certainly, Congressman. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's been repeated on this um, uh, panel, a uh, common refrain you'll hear is that uh, a very important benefit of AI is enabling the doctors and nurses to, to do the doctoring and the nursing. Um, what Transcarent does, right, is we really believe in freeing up the time of the doctor to spend with the patient and reducing the time required for administrative burden. So the way we use AI is in our clinic. When a patient comes to the clinic, an AI assistant d gathers information from them uh, and synthesizes that information for the doctors. Uh, that enables the doctors to come into the visit and see all the information organized and spend time on that diagnosis and that treatment um, and really creating the plan with the patient, right? That frees up time and that frees up capacity to see more patients, including patients in rural areas, since we serve 4.4 million Americans across the entire United States. Right. Good. Mr. Uh, Shin, let me ask you, um, I, I've heard that sometimes there's bias in AI and that that can actually be good. That's somewhat baffling to me, but nevertheless, can you explain to me... Um, how, how that might be and how bias can sometimes help improve the utility of AI in healthcare? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Congressman. So I think what's very important here to make sure that we all uh, emphasize is that as we train these AI algorithms, 
these algorithms have to be trained with data that's respective of the patient population that they're going to be serving. So it's important that we work with our different clinical collaborators to find the right uh, type of patient data to train these AI algorithms, again, that, that, that are going to be applied towards that patient population and making sure that that patient population uh, is reflected in the data that's actually training those algorithms themselves. Okay. All right, I, I've got one last question, and, I, and it's kind of for all of you, and, or any of you, if you will, and that is we have a doctor's caucus here in Congress, and I, I'm a healthcare professional pharmacist by profession, and, and, um, and I, I've served in the state legislature on health care, and one of the things that I notice is that a lot of our health care costs have increased because of defensive medicine, doctors running unnecessary lab tests just really to protect themselves from litigious um, patients or, or our situations, but how, how is that going to impact the practice of medicine if a physician doesn't use AI and then something happens and then, you know, all of a sudden they're sued because you didn't use something that was available that you should have used? It seems to me like this could potentially increase health care costs as well. I see the savings, yes, but I've also seen and, and tried to deal with it on a state level and now on a federal level. And I'll open it up. Whoever wants to comment, go ahead. Here, I'll, I'll take a stab. So I think that we need to remind ourselves that healthcare decisions are made by physicians and practitioners, right? The, they should be the ultimate decider when it comes to coverage, when it comes to do you need to be admitted to the hospital, what treatment do you need? These need to be made by our trained healthcare physicians. But AI you're, you're is, a healthcare professional. I am. You're not a lawyer. I am. And I'm, 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 you know, I got to feel like from a lawyer's perspective, they're going to take a different approach. Well, but that's why I think it's important that we understand that as a, as a community, as an industry, that we're not turning over decision making. These are tools. These are tools in their tool belt that, and we need to view them as such, not as an authoritative decision that, you know, that someone should be held uh, accountable to. Anyone else? Quickly? I'll just say that if, if we can prove that AI systems save lives, then people should be using them. And if we can't, then we should be relying on clinician judgment. And I think that ultimately I don't know that, that we'll translate. ever get away from relying on clinician judgment, though. I, I agree with you. I think that it's unlikely, certainly in my lifetime. Right. Good. Okay, thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Pence, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Guthrie and uh, Ranking Member Eshoo, and thank you, the panel, for being here today. Incorporating AI technologies into healthcare systems may improve and streamline diagnosis and treatment options, in, in addition to easing the administration burden at healthcare facilities. Patients' personal medical data and background information, however, is typically the foundation of AI delivery in healthcare. The trust and safeguarding of personal information between patients and their providers is critical for people receiving the highest quality of care. In the ecosystem of electronic apps and wearables, there are areas where healthcare data is not clearly protected. I had a hospital in my district uh, in Hancock County that was on 60 Minutes a number of years ago. That's why this committee needs to consider a federal data policy law to set the foundation of protections on how such data is collected, used, and shared. We should do that before we can look at regulating AI and healthcare and find the balance in simultaneously encouraging private innovation. Our increasingly digital world leaves Hoosiers and all Americans in the dark about who has access to their information. It's alarming to me how little consumers and patients know about how personal details of their lives are collected, shared with third parties, and monetized without their informed consent, monetized uh, no, with no recompense to the pro provider of the information. Patient trust and those responsible for safeguarding personal data is paramount in the use of emerging technologies in healthcare. Dr. Schlosser, as we introduce new AI technologies in healthcare, patients deserve to have control over when their information is collected, who has access to their data, the right to remove their data, and where their data might be shared. Here's the question. Should healthcare organizations that collect protected medical information be transparent with patients on how their data is stored, who has access to their data, and, and for today's hearing, 
identifying that AI is part of the process? Yes. So I, I would agree with everything that you just said. I, I think we fully support the idea that we should be transparent with our patients, and we currently are through a rigorous consent process as to how the data is being used, how it's being protected, and how it may be stored and shared. Um, and I think as the use of AI expands, that will become increasingly important so patients can know where that data is going and how it might be used. I'll just add that AI is entirely dependent on the data. And so if we want the benefits of AI, we also have to do this in a way that enables us to use that data to train and fine tune algorithms. So there's a really important balance we need to strike here, ensuring that we're transparent and we keep the data, patient's data private, but we don't create too many barriers to actually using that data to train algorithms to achieve all these wonderful outcomes we've been talking about. Yeah, and it, you know, the, it comes to mind back, back in a previous life of mine, you know, it's garbage in and garbage out, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the wrong, the wrong algorithm or the wrong collection point of the data can skew the outcome in a big way. We, in, in finance, we say you can pay off the national debt uh, with the wrong numbers. Would anyone else like to uh, answer that? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I appreciate your question very much. I think that, uh, as Dr. Schlosser has said, your AI strategy is your data strategy. I, I would point out that within the ecosystem of treatment, payment, and operations, all of us uh, health systems, providers, insurance companies are covered by HIPAA laws around data privacy. And where I think that the greater risk lies is with these consumer health apps and others that are accessing data either directly from patients, from health systems with patient consent via the 21st Century Cares Act, uh, and other mechanisms. And I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of healthcare data floating around that is not subject to HIPAA today because of uh, these mechanisms. And so I, I think it is a risk and, and something that should be looked at legislatively. And, and your concern is that that would go into AI computation? Is that, is that what you're referring to? I think there's a number of risks of those uh, data sets being used either to generate algorithms without transparency or to uh, target uh, for advertising other types of uh, uh, uses to patients yeah. without their awareness. I, I go to the doctor and I Googled all the answers, right? So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Dr. Joyce is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie, and Ranking Member Eshoo for holding today's hearing. And to the witnesses being with us here today, we appreciate both your time and your testimony. Artificial intelligence has made a significant impact on our day-to-day -day lives, and the benefits that industries and individuals derive through its use are very, very numerous. As this technology continues to explode onto the scene, it has become especially prevalent in healthcare. But like many industries where AI is seeing a dramatic increase in usage, there are and there will be certain risks associated with it that we must contend with as policymakers. While that should not demean the potential efficacy of its day-to-day -day uses, applications, and functions, AI remains a tool, a tool that utilizes vast amounts of data and with its integration into healthcare space, we must be vigilant to ensure that sensitive patient information is safe, is secure, and is protected. As we move forward, Congress must have that unique task of analyzing and further understanding AI's evolution and applicability when it comes to healthcare. While President Biden's executive order on artificial intelligence might lay out the administrative policy initiatives, it is still the responsibility of Congress to legislate. It is paramount that Congress has a firm grasp and a clear comprehension on how AI interacts with existing regulations so that we can ensure AI first does no harm, but instead continues to positively reshape the healthcare industry. Dr. Wen, patients that live in rural areas, like the district that I represent in Pennsylvania, often face barriers that impede their access to healthcare. Do you believe that AI has the potential to quash those impediments? And if so, how can we incentivize further adoption of AI technologies? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Absolutely. Um, you know, the distribution of care to rural areas and the barriers to access are, are well known and great. Um, AI can 
quash those barriers and really close those gaps in a few different ways. Um, first, you know, there is always a supply and demand problem when you think about distribution of resources across rural areas. Making clinicians more efficient, right? Making clinicians um, more available means that there are more clinicians available to see those patients in rural areas. Um, two, many of the barriers come also from a lack of health literacy, a lack of access, right, um, to the healthcare system. AI also can help patients in rural areas uh, level the playing field, right, by assisting them in better understanding their care, better navigating the care system, uh, and, and better understanding uh, how to find the best care for themselves. Uh, the incentives, right, that uh, Congress can encourage, right, include uh, the development and education of AI skill sets across the healthcare system, but specifically in the clinicians who are going to practice in rural areas and the healthcare leaders who are going to lead systems in rural areas. Um, that education is very, very important, as I mentioned in my statement. It doesn't come naturally to uh, many of our institutions, uh, but it's, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Schlosser, welcome to another Johns Hopkins trained physician. <laughs> I took that to Congress, you took that another direction. The <laughs> FDA has been regulating some forms of AI under existing authorities for drugs and biologics, as well as medical devices. Do you think that the current regulatory structure is sufficient to keep up with the innovation in AI's uses in healthcare? Yes, and uh, thank you for the question. Um, I actually have some experience. I was a medical officer for the FDA uh, a number of years ago, and uh, I would say that the, reg the rate at which AI is changing healthcare is likely going to require us to think a little bit differently about how we re regulate medical devices. Uh, the, the current approach, which really is based on laws from 1974, uh, I think never really anticipated the kind of technology we're talking about. So dealing with uh, models that can learn uh, over time um, is something that we're going to have to work together, I think, to figure out what that regulatory pathway looks like. Uh, this is, there's incredible potential here, but I feel the, the movement and the progress of AI is a little bit outpacing um, the, the current regulatory approach. Thank you. And Chairman Guthrie, briefly before I yield, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter of support from the American College of Surgeons. Seeing no objection, it's ordered. Thank you, and again, thank you for the witnesses for being here, and I yield. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Archberger, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. I've, I've heard a couple of you speak before. This is really interesting stuff. Um, and I'll start with you, Dr. Slosser, since you're from Tennessee or HCA. Um, let's talk about the pharmaceutical supply chain, and it, it can be very difficult and complex to trace and as a pharmacist, I'm responsible for knowing every step in that process from the, in the supply chain, from the manufacturer to the dispensing of the drug because of the pedigree. How can AI be used to help pharmacists uh, in their role optimizing medication use and patient health outcomes and uh, providing patient care? How can we use that? And hopefully we can be reimbursed for that. Yeah, well, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. Um, and I think there's tremendous opportunity. We actually already use uh, varieties of artificial intelligence in our pharmacy processes, and we've actually done this for years. We have uh, heuristic models, which are basically rules-based models that are constantly surveilling patient charts, looking for opportunities that, that can serve up to the pharmacist, be they uh, drug uh, interactions or substitutions or places where we can be more efficient or provide more effective treatment. And so I think those models are only going to improve and get better uh, with the advent of these more advanced artificial intelligent algorithms. I think the same is true for our, our pharmacy supply chains, and we've mentioned this already today, but the ability to get predictive in understanding the demands and needs of our patients on a hospital or even unit basis, and then be able to go back upstream and ensure that we have the adequate supply to meet those demands, and if we don't, can we make kind of preemptive steps to ensure that we can maintain adequate supplies is another area that we're already working on, and I think there'll be great benefit. Very good. You've already told us about how HCA, the hospital system, uh, sees value in the adoption of AI technologies without even additional payment in that. And you've talked to us about removing the administrative burden and uh, its reduction of time spent 
that does not involve direct patient care. Um, so this is my question, and this is your chance to tell me what to do. What recommendations do you have for this committee in creating payment models in AI for healthcare services application and add-ons? Yeah, and, and some of my panelists have had a chance to weigh on this already today. Uh, I, I do think as this technology advances and it becomes more uh, a, a meaningful and central part of healthcare delivery, um, that CMS is going to have to find an approach to reimburse uh, for this technology. And in, in my personal opinion, it's not that different than the initial approaches they tried to take around chronic disease management of how do you reimburse for sort of the ongoing work that in this case an algorithm would do to help prevent complications, to help reduce cost. The, the last comment I would want to make here is that I think we have a great opportunity with AI since we're at the beginning is to take a really a business case minded approach to how we deploy this technology and not have it just be uh, another technology that we deploy that adds more cost and then we try to add more reimbursement uh, and therefore drive up the cost of the healthcare system, but instead be really thoughtful about how can these technologies make us more efficient and more effective and decrease the overall cost of the healthcare system as we deploy them. Well, we're going to have to. So you will continue to exist. Um, Dr. Longhurst, how do you think AI and medical liability intersect? Fantastic question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, as was previously mentioned on this, AI is a tool. Whether it's being used for diagnosis or treatment options or others, ultimately the liability for treatment of the patient rests with the treating physician. Yeah. And so we've had uh, perhaps not AI tools for a long time, but we've certainly had clinical decision support tools for a long time that suggest potential drug-drug interactions or yeah. dose range errors and other things. And the liability has always rested with the treating clinician to see these alerts, manage them, but make the best decision for the patient. So I think uh, that the real question about liability in AI comes if you take the human out of the loop. Wow. Uh, if there is a uh, step that's taken towards making diagnoses without clinicians, then it begs all sorts of other questions about licensing these tools. Yeah, exactly. Do you see a scenario where litigation might increase if doctors don't utilize AI? That is a fantastic question as well. In fact, a recent Boston Globe survey of patients asked, uh, would you uh, see a, a doctor that was not using AI? And the, the really? predominant uh, answer from patients was, I would be concerned if my doctor was not using the latest tools. Okay. So I, uh, I think, as was recently described by Dr. Newman Toker, if these tools are shown to be best practice, if they can decrease mortality, if they can increase survivorship, then they will become a best practice that should be used in every case. Okay. Thank you, sir. And I think I'm out of time, so I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Iowa, Dr. Miller Meeks, for five minutes for questions. Well, thank you very much. And I just want to add in my own personal experience with electronic health records as a doctor. And it's much more than two hours of my time after seeing 30 to 35 to 40 patients in a day. Just as an example, on a uh, global post-op, no charge. After I finished completing my medical record, it took an additional six clicks to put in no charge. Now it takes me 10 seconds to write in dash C. It took two minutes to six clicks to no charge. Um, so uh, it certainly does lead to burnout. Um, I'd also like to follow up on something Dr. Longhurst said and then also Dr. Schlosser. Uh, and certainly the FDA has not kept up with uh, medical devices utilizing uh, artificial intelligence, not only generative, but repetitive machine learning. And uh, at the University of Iowa, Dr. Uh, Michael Abramoff, MD, PhD, um, has one of those first medical devices that's approved by the FDA. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, submit for the record um, uh, an article on effectiveness of artificial intelligence screening in preventing vision loss from diabetes, a policy model. Uh, and then that would uh, lead to uh, reimbursement. And what's great about this is um, that it increases access by having a device that can be put into any person's office, whether it's an eye care provider or family practitioner. Um, and then the second letter is a letter of support from Johnson & Johnson uh, that does talk about privacy, equity, bias, uh, in, and transparency in the system since those things have been brought up. Thank you. Well, uh, we're going to accept the documents list at the end. We'll make sure those are included and, and give the, my friend here a chance to review. Thanks. I, I know. I, I, I did it first because I'm older and I forget things. So, 
Um, so, uh, Mr. Shin, uh, we've heard a lot about AI over the past few years and the potential risk attributed to unregulated AI integration. However, the FDA has been regulating software-based medical products since the 1970s, and we know that AI integration into healthcare has already raised the status quo of care. We have seen it in digital pathology, drug optimization, um, integration uh, in uh, patient engagement, personalized risk uh, prediction. Can you give examples where gaps exist in current regulation that Congress can address to ensure continued innovation that will drive better, more personalized care for patients without burdensome overregulation? Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I think what, what we're seeing with, with the FDA, and we continue to work very closely with the FDA to try to make sure that they stay current with the rapidly changing technologies that are there. I think the challenge that we're seeing is that, the, is, and it was acknowledged here on this panel today, is, is really how artificial intelligence continues to change. And, and what <laughs> becomes an AI algorithm today might be a different AI algorithm tomorrow or might need to be adjusted or, or increased in terms of accuracy or whatnot after it's being used in the clinical setting. So I think this is where areas like, like, like PCCP that we had worked on here with this committee previously, these are all important aspects that the FDA needs to consider and actually not, and, and not water down in terms of its ability because that actually then will inhibit us from being able to continue to develop and innovate in this particular area. Thank you. Um, Dr. Schlosser, many hospitals and hospital systems are facing significant staff shortages. We're seeing AI as a meaningful tool to help alleviate some of the administrative burdens that are driving providers away from the medical profession. A recent report from Goldman Sachs notes that shifts in workflows triggered by these advances could expose the equivalent of 300 million full-time jobs to automation. What steps can Congress take to facilitate better AI integration to health systems to streamline processes that will allow healthcare professionals to focus more on patients and less on billing, coding, et cetera? Well, that's a great question, Congresswoman. Thank you. And, and I think this is incredibly important that we do streamline uh, our ability to use AI to tackle this serious workforce problem that we have that is only going to continue to get bigger. We think the gap between supply and demand for nurses alone is going to continue to increase over the next decade. Uh, and so I would say the easy answer is let's not put too many burdensome regulations between us and our ability to deploy AI to support our healthcare workforce. We're not talking about AI directly influencing patients or providing diagnoses. We're talking about it removing administrative burdens. And that is an area where, with the right responsible AI platforms, we should be able to move quickly to adopt those technologies and free up that workforce uh, to handle this increasing demand. Well, thank you. And I saw Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Longhurst shaking their heads, so I think that you're in agreement. And since I'm running out of time, I've got another question I'll submit for the record. And with that, I yield back my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. The general, general lady yields back. And if you'll give us those let, let documents you submitted for the record so we can review those, we appreciate it. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Obernolte, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses. It's been a really interesting hearing. Uh, Mr. Shen, I wanted to ask you about some of your interactions with the FDA, because we're really at a crossroads when it comes to devising a regulatory framework for artificial intelligence. We can either follow the lead of entities like the European Union, who believe that uh, AI is its own a kind of unique discipline and that there needs to be a, a separate bureaucracy spun up to issue licenses with respect to the use of AI, or we can follow the lead of countries like the UK who has pointed out that because the risk of AI is so contextual uh, that the existing sectoral authorities are best equipped uh, to, to regulate within their sectoral spaces with a bunch of technical help and resource. So uh, I was curious, I mean, we're, we're, we have to choose, right? That's, we're at a crossroads. We, have, we can go one way or the other way. There's really no middle ground. Which of those two paths do you think we should follow? Is it easier to teach the FDA what it doesn't know about AI, or, or is it easier to teach a brand new agency everything the FDA already knows about ensuring patient safety? Yeah, uh, very good question, Congressman. I think. Certainly this is a, is a tricky topic, but I think what we have to remember is that, the, that at least in our industry from a vendor perspective, we have been working closely with the FDA for many, many years here. And we work as, as Siemens Health Nears, we have direct dialogues with them around this topic on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. I think the other thing that's important to re remind ourselves here, especially in the, in the context of artificial intelligence, is that AI is, is, 
is not, can't not just be considered as a separate type of technology, but this technology is also being embedded into the medical devices themselves as well. So, for instance, you know, CT scanners or MRI scanners, they have AI that's built in there into that system that allows for better image quality or faster, faster exams for the patient. So a lot of benefits to the patient are happening already with the AI technology built into the, tech, uh, built into the medical devices themselves. So we have to consider that, especially when we consider how we want to uh, move forward with the FDA. Right. Uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, I also am heartened by your comment that you feel the existing re regulatory relationship with the FDA is doing a good job at uh, both ensuring patient safety and uh, catalyzing innovation. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty powerful argument, you know, for, uh, for maintaining that relationship and empowering the FDA to regulate in that space. Uh, Dr. Newman Tolker. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. You said something that I found incredibly interesting. Uh, you said that the best that we can expect from AI is that it repeat the existing human bi biases that exist in the data it was trained with. And uh, I, I found that a fascinating statement. I, I mean, I, uh, I don't like the use of the word bias because it's a very human word. And when you apply it to a machine learning algorithm, I mean, there's no such thing as bias. They're all biased. I mean, machine learning is all about bias because you're training it to generalize, you know, and, and we, we call that bias when we talk about uh, uh, kind of maintaining our social, uh, social standards. You know, when we say, for example, it would be wrong to consider someone's race when making a hiring decision, we can all agree that that's true. But uh, that also means scrubbing the data that we use to train AI that makes those recommendations for things that can be used as proxies for race. And that's the, the difficulty that we've had so far. So you, you were talking about how important it is in, uh, in the, co the medical context of maintaining high quality data sets to avoid those kinds of biases. Um, how do we ethically navigate this space of, uh, of patient consent? You know, if, if you have a chest x-ray, and I think it was uh, Dr. Longhurst that was talking about uh, detecting uh, uh, COVID uh, pneumonia from a chest x-ray. You know, if, you, if you're a patient, you come in, you get a chest x-ray, you have not consented for the use of that x-ray to be used to train a machine learning algorithm. You know, do you have the right to say, no, I don't want my data used? Uh, and if you do, I mean, the problem is that is introducing bias into the algorithm because, you know, from a statistical sense, you're biasing the outcome of the algorithm, because who knows what else the group of people who would you know, withhold consent have in common, right? So uh, a, a statistician would say that's a serious problem. So how do we navigate that space? How do we, how do we protect the, the uh, patient data and at the same time avoid biasing these algorithms? Uh, thank you, Congressman. This is a great question. So, uh, you know, I come from the world of clinical research where there's always the opportunity to refuse to participate, and I'm generally of the mind that that, that, that that should always be the case, that if patients wish to opt out, they do. It does create a certain bias. There's a volunteer bias of those who want to participate. Um, but I think that's a bias we can accept. As far as the issue of um, the, the replicating the sort of human biases, as I mentioned in my testimony, I believe that we have um, this at, it exists at diff two different levels, but the most important piece is where our biases are causing us to behave differently as clinicians. So if, if I don't order the same test in a black patient that I order in a white patient for the same circumstance and the same condition and the same appropriateness, um, that's the kind of bias that I don't want to replicate in my AI systems. And I think that's why well-curated gold standard data sets are so critical. Yeah, I, well, I would agree. And I'm an AI optimist, so I would actually argue against your statement, you know, that the best we can expect is the replication of existing biases. I think it's a golden opportunity to remove the biases. Well, I see I'm out of time, uh, but thank you very much for your testimony. I'll thank yield you. back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, we now have a vote on the floor, but we only have one, uh, w one member left to ask questions, so we're going to hopefully be able to complete this uh, now. But now, so we'll get started on that, and the next member to speak is our Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad we're, we're doing this hearing. I, I think we need a lot more hearings on AI uh, on multiple subjects. I, I think healthcare the utilization of AI in healthcare might be the least of our worries. Um, I, I also worry that we're not always talking about this uh, in, a, in an accurate way. We're, we're not properly differentiating between advanced algorithms and AI. We're just saying AI. And I just, that's, that's not from our witnesses. That, that's 
just for every, that's for Congress, that's for America. If we're going to properly regulate it, and I'm going to ask you what you guys mean by that. A few of you have said we need to properly regulate it. I'm genuinely curious how and, and what we do. Um, but we've, we have to talk about it accurately first. We mean machine learning. And we mean machine learning that you can't actually look under the hood and change. That's where it gets scary. If we're talking about advanced algorithms, look, people call Facebook and Instagram, listen and, and, and watch my actions, and they make predictive analysis based on that. I've, I've heard that used in test like today and called it AI. It's not AI. You can change that algorithm. You can change how that works. Programmers can go in there and change it. AI you cannot change. You cannot look under the hood. And so I think we just need to be really accurate about what we mean by AI. AI is meant to, is meant to mimic a person. And, and, and that, can be, that can be really amazing, especially for healthcare. And so I think things we have to talk about is, well, what data inputs go into that machine learning? Um, is it everything? That's how you get chat GPT. And what kind of person is it mimicking? A good person or a bad person? This stuff gets really scary really fast. Um, when we're talking about healthcare, it seems kind of obvious that you're going to limit the data inputs. Does that need to be a law? Is that, is that one of the regulations that you all are, are talking about? So actually, I'm going to stop there and ask you. A, a, couple, a, a couple of you said that we need to regulate it, um, but I, I'm curious what you mean by that. Uh, Dr. Newman Toker, maybe you could start, because I know you said that. Uh, sure. Thanks very much. I, uh, I, I think your question is very pertinent, Congressman. Um, in terms of regulatory oversight, I do think that there are certain gaps with respect, in particular to diagnosis, in this AI space. So I believe that, for example, if we think about direct-to-patient symptom checkers for, for diagnosis, where there's a legal disclaimer at the bottom that says, this is not medical advice, but patients are taking it as medical advice, that it's really incumbent upon us to pay more attention to that consumer health space, as has been brought up previously. So kind of like a digital watermark, almost. Like I've, 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 I've talked about that before with, with respect to AI. Like it should be known that whatever this output is is from AI, not a person. Right. Uh, not just, not just that, but but when people are making decisions about how to act, how and when to access the healthcare system, and it's based upon some kind of algorithmic decision making that's behind the scenes. Um, there should be an accountability if in that framework. And right now, there isn't any accountability to everything that exists outside the, the, the proper confines of, say, the hospital setting or a clinic. Before you get to the healthcare system, there's a lot going on that's, that, that, we, that we need can, to regulate. Can you give me an better. example of what you mean by that? Yeah, so let's say that somebody uh, types into their symptom checker that they're dizzy. And the symptom checker says, don't worry, it's nothing. It's little rock crystals in your ear, and, 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 and okay. you can stay This home. is hypothetical, by the way. Or is it not hypothetical? Is there, no, is there it's not hypothetical, okay. actually. There are a lot of symptom checkers that are out there. They've been studied Got pretty okay. significantly, and they've been looked at, uh, and their accuracy is often quite low. And these are just websites I can go yes, to. They're not FDA-regulated. Correct. Okay. And, and what essentially happens is that at the bottom, there's a legal disclaimer that essentially says this yeah. is just a toy. Yeah. If you want real medical advice, ask your medical professional. But that's not how patients are dealing with that. And I do think that some of those decision-making, you may have a stroke that's causing your dizziness. And if you need to be sent to the emergency department, but this, this system, this AI system that's out there, unregulated, is saying to you, don't worry, just stay home, uh, yeah. that's a real risk to the public health. I think there's a broad agreement here that we would never want AI to operate independently. Um, maybe not never, right? We might be in Star Trek mode at some point. But like, for definitely for foreseeable future that you would always have a, a, a doctor's blessing even because there's amazing things that can happen. We, we're seeing this uh, uh, technology coming out of China, unfortunately, and this gets to a competition problem too if we're going to overregulate things. But it's apparently uh, um, uh, diagnosing pancreatic cancer at 99% success rates. Like, whoa, that's amazing. Now, a doctor should still look at that after the fact and be like, yep, it is pancreatic cancer. But there's just amazing things that we can do with this with this technology. There's also amazing risks that can happen, especially when we're talking about that 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 more generalized, you know, generative AI, which is basically mimicking a person. And again, the question we Congress has to ask itself, whether it's healthcare or any other conversation about AI, is what kind of person is it mimicking? We don't, we don't know the answers to that, um, and we have not talked about it enough in this Congress. So I'm glad we're doing this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and that concludes all members uh, present for questions, and we 
thank our, uh, our witnesses for being here. But before we gavel out, I want we have a uh, um, the documents for the record that some members have asked for and some others have been submitted. And I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the documents included on the staff hearing documents no list. Objection. Without objection, that will be in order. And I remind members that some said they were going to submit questions to you. Uh, they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and we ask that the witnesses respond to the questions promptly. And members should submit, submit their question by the close of business on December the 13th. And we're, again, we appreciate everyone if you're being here and, and your time. This is uh, something we're still, as you get very curious and, and a lot very engaged members and want to understand it and working to understand it so we can act appropriately without uh, to protect but without impinging the great things that could come from this. So that's what we are focused on. And again, I uh, appreciate it. And without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned.